Sinfomaniac is full of spoilers. If the movie's there in the title, we're probably gonna say everything that happens in it. So don't fucking listen if you don't wanna know. Jenna Rollins is Gloria. She's tough, but she sides with the little guy. I don't wanna die. What do I do with you? You know, you're not my family or anything. You're, you're, you're just a neighbor's kid, right? Gloria, you know, we're not interested in you. All we want is the book and the kid. What are you going to do? Shoot a six-year-old kid on the street? For Gloria, the danger is always getting closer. And getting closer is always the danger. Tony? Gloria, how are you? Can you help me? Gloria, trust me. Maybe we can do something. Trust you? Hey, Tony, I know you. Where is the boy? I want to go home. Hey, don't be stupid. You got no home. You got me. I understand. You are a woman. He is a little boy. You fall in love. Every woman is a mother. You love him. I love Phil. Do you love me? How can I resist you? Hey, I don't like this kid. We need the boy. I'm gonna get up and walk out of here now. If you want to stop, you can. Like Cagney and Bogey and all those great tough guys. Now there is Gloria, the chick off the old block. Come on, come on. Oh, I'd love it. Come on. Don't hang back. I'd love it. I got a six-year-old kid over there that had his whole family murdered by you punks. Go ahead, Trent. OK? You let a woman be, ya. You little tiny nothing. General Rowland is Glory. She's trying to beat the mob at their own game. To me, the great hope is just people who normally wouldn't make movies are gonna be making them, and you know, suddenly one day some little fat girl in Ohio is gonna be the new Mozart, you know, and make a a beautiful film with her little father's camera. To me, the great hope is girl in Ohio is going to be the new Mozart. To me, the great hope is people who normally wouldn't make movies are going to be making them. To me, the great hope is in Ohio is going to be the new Mozart. To me, the great hope is people who normally wouldn't make movies are going to be making them. To me, the great hope is one day some little fat girl in Ohio is going to just be the new Mozart. Who would make them in Ohio is going to be the new Mozart. Just people who normally wouldn't make them Mozart and be making them. To me, the great hope girl in Ohio is going to make a Mozart beautiful film with her little father's camera recorder and for once the so-called professionalism about movie Mozart destroyed forever. Wow, oh. wow, wow. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you kind of uh, like uh, thinking about like, oh, you know, this 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 movie here. <laughs> this is real fresh in my mind. I usually yeah, don't I watch the day of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I usually watch the weekend before when I have mm -hmm. more time. Um, but this past weekend, I ended up working a little bit more and being a little bit more busy. So I didn't watch this um, but also, I think we didn't speak about it till after the weekend. So, um, oh, I think I texted you about it on on like Monday or Sunday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like hella fresh in my mind. Um, <laughs> That's good. I, um, yeah. So I was excited to kind of take a break from that and do um, travel through time a little bit. Travel Cultural. through time, yeah. Culturally, That's a, actually, I, a really good way to to put it, actually, because um, even some of the other things just even outside this specific movie, I, I want to address, have a lot to do with that concept in terms of um, the sort of uh, journey into the past, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 uh, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to take that dive, but everything else 
going okay with you? Oh yeah. Just been mm-hmm. uh getting ready for my birthday weekend. This weekend I'm gonna be oh, out of town. Oh wow. Yes. I am very excited for my I'm just doing a little road trip. Um going to see something that's on my bucket list that's in California that's not too far away. Mm-hmm. It's called the Winchester Mystery House. Oh wow. Um, and it's actually was owned by the family that owned the Winchester Rifle Company. And they, oh, wow. yes, there's a lot of folklore and local legends about this house because there are stairs that lead to nowhere and doors that open to a 30 foot drop. Um, like it's just an architectural <laughs> marvel and I've always wanted to walk through it. And um, it seems COVID friendly because they're doing small uh, self-guided tours instead of the large tours that they used to do. So um, small groups go in like little pods, I believe. And mm. yeah, and you go at your own pace, which is also kind of cool. Cause if you get creeped out by one specific area, you can rush to a less creepy or more creepy area (laughs) i'm very excited yeah no that's um that's that's really cool like i i've always like um i like it's because it kind of combines the historical stuff with just like the sort of haunted house experience yeah you know absolutely yeah i like that i believe the legend is that she kept building it so it's like hundreds and hundreds of rooms she just kept building it because she had the superstition that when she stopped bad things would happen Oh, I wow. that I sounds super familiar. Place, I think I might have yeah. heard of this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a famous, it's a famous old house. So I think that's the legend for it, but I'll find out more this weekend yeah. for sure. But I'm really excited. Um, because I've always wanted to walk. Well, uh, I did have you know. a full reaction to Gloria. Let me yes, be 100. Let's let's let's, uh, it, let's let's get into that. We should I did have a full reaction. I'm still having a full reaction. Um yeah. my lasting it's weird, but like the last taste in my mouth Mm -hmm. if we're going backwards to forwards just because this is odd but like I was getting Harold and Maude vibes okay that makes sense like the love and then the like kiss like not full not full (laughs) but then she says things like he's the greatest guy I've ever slept with (laughs) and I'm like why that's one of my favorite lines why are you using those words well, in that I, order? Okay, so Why? so so I think she's let's talk about the, you- the premise of the movie. The premise really Gloria being like a really good friend of mine who won't be named in case she ever listens to this, who hates kids. <laughs> uh, okay. Hates kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, doesn't want anything to do with them, will pat them on the head in passing and then like wash a hand, you know, oh, kids are oh, dirty. Oh yeah, yeah, of, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh person. I hate kids, especially and I really, yours. I de- especially yours. Yeah. She says stuff like I'm like, mind. oh man. <laughs> um so Gloria is like, you know, friends with this woman who's got these kids and mm-hmm. she's friends with a woman but like a, hates the kids. And but cares about her friend, obviously in the end we feel like she really must care about her friend to go through all of this for her son. Um, yeah, she finds out that because she goes to borrow some coffee from her friend, and her friend and her whole family are in the room with guns, waiting for the mob to come get them because the husband is an accountant for the mob, and he was dumb enough to write everything down and tell them about it. Why are you going to tell them about it? That seems like bad moves, anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> let's you know, start with I'll the say. bad moves if yeah, you're gonna yeah. if you're gonna work for mobsters and you're gonna do things they're not gonna like don't maybe don't tell them right away maybe don't blatantly just tell them you're breaking the rules anyway so so glory is there like okay what do i do and she basically shoves her kid at them at her and is like you have to take my kids and i can't remember why for some reason the daughter's like i'm staying the daughter's the, like I'm the not daughter going. is basically like it's one of those things where I'm being like a dumb, like 13 year old girl type of stubborn stuff. And it's like, honestly, it's actually one of the weirder notes in the movie, but it it feels very true to me. Like she doesn't go with it, but yeah, well, it's, it's, it's kind of like, she would be in the way when it, she would be in the way, but I honestly, the way it read to me is like, yeah, there's that like weird, stubborn, uh, early teenage year girl kind of like angstiness. Where she's just trying to fight with a little bit of angst, 
but like it's her mom knows what it means if she doesn't leave yeah her dad yeah. knows what it means so why does leave. and they basically her. are like Force her to leave. honestly honestly i think they're kind of like uh they're all dead anyway they're all dead anyway and they're just like and they're just like whatever and you know when uh uh the father is played by buck henry when he's like given the um the ledger to the son uh phil mm -hmm. it's like he you know he's talking to him like oh you have to be you have to be the man now um and i i get the impression that like not necessarily obviously he has some confidence that though like he might have a way out of this but i think in his mind this is fucked up or, it's like or it, he it, could be it could be some, you know, some false sense of hope where he's like, maybe, maybe one of them, maybe he'll make it, you know? Well, yeah. What I'm saying is, is that like, he's, he's basically like, they're all dead anyways. But if someone's going to escape, even though this kid is like four years old, like, or six years, seven years old, what? Six. Yes, you're right. Six. Even though he's like six years old, it's like, he's small enough that he might be able to get out. And if he has the sister with them, she'll slow him down. Like it's weird or to think that, be, but it's well, you know, no, not really, because you know, if you're ever on the lamb, you're supposed to split up because they can't get both of you, and it's harder to track two if you split. Well, up. that's what, I, but, the, but that's what I'm saying. So maybe if, he, if like, the sister maybe goes with them, it's not. To, if the sister goes with them, it's more obvious that it's them. Right. That's yeah. And that's that's my they point. would have been caught immediately. They would have been caught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they are right. So. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, obviously putting Phil out there and at that point he knows he's going with Gloria too. By the way, he, he also has a man name. Let's talk about the fact that he's a child called Phil. Um, <laughs> so I have a whole, Why is it so weird okay, to me? Hold on. I have a whole extended. Like um, when little boys are called yeah. Richard. I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I just don't. I, I, I do you have sound like a 60 year old man. I have quite the extended bit about this actually. Um, <laughs> I kind of want to save it uh, for for later later in because okay. I think well, let's skip it. No, no, now. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why because there's a whole sort of. Um, I think what my where I really want to get to with that, that like that kind of paints why I'm saying this is there's a kind of tradition of a certain type of male, a certain type of New York male that like runs through, uh, you know, these Cassavetes movies. And like Phil is like that, but somehow he's just shrunk down into this body of a six year old. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's because like, he says <laughs> he says some crazy things. He says some very crazy things, and I wrote some one of, of my those favorite. Down. Oh my god, one go of ahead, my go favorite. Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna call them Philisms. Philisms. That's so, a great name. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You can't keep shooting everybody that comes knocking at your door. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll I'll give you I'll give you <laughs> one of my favorites right now, and it's Go. uh, it. <laughs> this is the greatest line of the whole movie. The first time I saw this movie, I like literally rewound it and played it back like thirty thousand <laughs> times. Wait. And again, I'm gonna give more context about why this line I think is the best line ever. But There's goes, a lot of pressure here, Marcus. Yeah, but he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes. You're not my mother. My mother's beautiful. <laughs> And the way he emphasizes the beautiful in the most like <laughs> New Yorker kind of way is the best thing ever. He goes, my mother's beautiful. <laughs> like, <laughs> and honestly, it rings very true because you don't know what he's about to say. And you're like, uh, Julie Carvin, who plays Jerry, his mother, we were like, oh shit, she is like quite the <laughs> stunning looker. So like, um, you know, not, not, which I'll also talk about. It's like, not that uh, fucking... Um, uh, Jenna, Jenna Rollins isn't, but like she's old, and my mother's like looks she also like she's looks. Like 22 how how years does old. she look the same in this movie as she did in the Notebook? Somehow, <laughs> like she looks mm. the same. <laughs> yes, uh, she. She's that's, that's, she's that's she's funny. the most beautiful. She's been the same old lady for a really really long time. <laughs> I think that's what it is, though. Is that like you like she's this know, beautiful? Just yeah, like I, I, and then yeah. and then she pulls this stuff. By the way, mm -hmm. let's talk about. The fact that she's this beautiful blonde woman, but like an older woman. Why is no one in New York concerned that she's waving a gun all around New York in public and pushing kids into taxis and stuff? 
Okay, this is a good point. Except- initially, I'm like, well, why is no one calling? I want, and I am embarrassed to mm-hmm. say, yes, but we're we're friends here. I forgot they didn't have cell phones for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why is no one calling anyone? No. And then I'm like, wait, they have to go find a payphone, put some coins in call the cops or maybe you don't have to call was a 911 call free i don't i don't know uh yeah it's no, been so long no no 911 is free 911 free okay so they would at least have yeah. to find a phone go to a business or go to a place and like find a phone and call 911 but okay no you're right about all that and just be like not- oh 18 minutes ago i saw uh, okay we're else. we're going to we're going to go very okay this is i'm glad you're bringing this up but we're we're going to go very deep in on this because the key to this movie and why I love it is that it's like the one like maybe the most to me personally and I'll get into why like the most quintessentially new york movie ever and part of like a big part of the reason is shit like that because that is new york to a t no one gives a flying fuck about what other people are doing Someone could be literally riding off gun. Nobody would call the cops or bother anybody. They'd be like, if the, the only thing they would do is if they thought you were like annoying or interrupting their conversation, they'd start screaming at you. <laughs> they wouldn't call the cops and they wouldn't like fucking act all scared or anything. They'd be like, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> like, 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 get it. So, and, and that the movie captures this. And also, I want to point out there's multiple and, times where I'm just like, why does no one care? What's but happening? like it's also Gloria herself, and when, when I yes. again, when I say that Gloria is like the, the quintessential New York, Gloria is like a quintessential like New York and specifically Bronx lady. And mm-hmm. it, like when you see a Bronx lady like that, even if they're dressed, it, yeah, even when they're dressed in all pink, okay, you're like you're like that lady's fucking crazy, and well, I Phil don't even fuck with it. her. Phil I don't said, talk to her. Phil Phil tells her you're tough. You are tough, and she's like. <laughs> I'm not tough. Uh, and she, he's like, well, not tough, like strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, she, I, she is. She is. And I, I can't think believe, I can't believe the things that she did for this kid that she didn't like. Well, you know, you what's know? funny. It, and okay, maybe, like, maybe Tony, the mobster, mm-hmm. maybe touched on that a little bit toward the mm-hmm. end of the movie. Yeah. Where he says, every woman's a mother and you fell in love. I didn't fall. And I don't love that kid. I don't kidding? love that kid. Him. And he had just said, I love you. And she goes, thanks. Yeah, very yeah. Han Solo-esque. Very, very cool of her. <laughs> Gloria is a female Han Solo. That's great. She really I is. Yeah, the, no, that's it's, very, like the, it's very true. It's, it's, it's very true. I mean, he could have easily, I mean, Han Solo could have easily said thanks instead of I know. And it would have mm-hmm. given the same vibes. So they pass their own vibe, vibe checks, these two characters. Um, yeah, so I think I think basically kind of um, well before I get to this, I'll just like I, I want to because I'm sure it all it's all going to come back around. But like before I circle away from it, like just like honestly, because you said you just watched it, like based off the way watched, you're talking well, I about it, the beginning yesterday, and then I finished yeah. it. I tried to finish it when I got home this morning, but it didn't. Right. Happen. So you just more accurately, you just finished it. I mean, I'm. Based off the way you're talking, I'm gonna assume the the answer is yes. But like, did you really like like this movie? <laughs> I ended up really liking this movie when okay. it started. I was like, I'm not sure. sure if I'm gonna like this. Mm. Um, I did. I did like. I like to look at the opening credits. You know, I did like the. Um, mm. They did this. They did the series of impressionist, of uh, modern yeah, impressionist yeah. paintings of new york and then they bleed into the actual cityscape of new york Mm -hmm. and to me and i could be digging i usually dig a little too much that could be here's an impression of our of the situation (laughs) um Mm. because literally that's kind of how i took it was here's an artistic rendering of the city here's an artistic rendering of a story um here you go yeah i like that yeah no i see what you mean i mean that's Um, okay go ahead go ahead keep going she i think maybe this is like part of what you were talking about about being very new york yes but she and again this also probably goes back to her not being around kids also a Mm. lot she does not sugarcoat anything she does not care that this is a six-year-old child 
a bait like a that's a baby and he's like i want to go home and she's like what are you gonna find there dead bodies and i'm like oh my god (laughs) this is a baby you no, gotta yeah, down a yeah, no, bit. You, you hit the you nail gotta... on the head. Now, Gloria in particular, <laughs> Gloria in particular, like, but like, this is the thing, like, the, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where what we're talking about with Gloria is like, is like something that's truly, not, if not unique, at least like specific to Gloria, because everything that's even specific about Gloria, I would argue, is just just a shorthand for the way most of these quote quintessential Bronx ladies that I'm talking about are. And so that's <laughs> a perfect example because plenty of obviously li- women in the Bronx are mother, actual mothers with actual children, but, and, and no understand that children aren't necessarily supposed to get talked to that way. And yet they always talk to them that way. Like, <laughs> like that, that's exactly like what you're they, like, They'd be like, be like, like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. There's a dead body in there. Get the hell out of there. There's, there's a very kind of just <laughs> like everything body. is that. Everything is that sort of, uh, especially when, the, you know, this movie, which came out in 1980, which more or less makes it the 70s. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, it's particularly in the 70s, like, like the, the attitude in, in most inner cities and the attitude at large towards, um, you know, child rearing was much looser and much like, Oh, for sure. especially people in smoked, new york people let their kids drink and smoke well, it's, and it's, not that it's, people it's, don't now but it was hey, just more white thing. that in particular sh- for sure and that's very troubling for but sure just, my parents but part of it and yeah part of it i'd say is that they, they just they didn't just pay attention to anything period it was like you if you were a kid even as young as phil you'd be like you you get let outside and you just roam around and do whatever you want and then as long as you come back for dinner all right, whatever. And I don't even ask you about your day. I'm just like, just stop yelling. Just fucking eat (laughs) and and go to bed and brush your teeth. That's basically it. And, um, you know, like that was, that was kind of for, you know, for better and for worse. And there's a lot of variation, you know, within that range, you know, but, uh, that was just kind of the parenting style in general. So someone who's a non-parent like Gloria, that's the mm-hmm. parenting that not only she grew up with, but it's the parenting she probably sees, you know, that her friend Jerry kind of give her own kids. So she doesn't even think the kid needs that much coddling. And she, like she says, I don't even like these kids. And that's another, that's another side to it too, is because it would be common back then for like parents even to be like, ah, I hate kids. And they're like, yeah, if the kid runs up when I'm talking to my friend, like Gloria, she's like, get the hell out of here, kid. Like, like <laughs> run, away, get, you know, run away. Like, so there's, there is that kind of uh, just um, it, it sort of weird walls of separation and yet they kind of make everyone kind of equal in a weird way. Cause that's the thing. The kids are grow up a lot quicker in, the, in that environment, if you will, again, for better and for worse. Um, yeah. You end up having to kind of I think be a little more independent. Case, to, especially... to be fair, the people that I know from who are from New York mm-hmm. tend to be better at navigating places. And I don't know, if it's that's, coincidence oh, or no, not. no 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 it's not, that's that's not a coincidence and something i i, I it will okay this is a perfect entry point into what i wanted to kind of start with anyway which was just this idea of new york movies and what i would call like a real new york movie versus what i would call kind of the the more tourist new york movie or movies that just are shot in new york or quote take place in new york the if i'm being and i'm i'm sorry if you're a fan but the fucking Taylor Swift welcome to New York movies. Like, okay, like, like, like that's that's the difference between Taylor what Swift I'm talking has made about. movies? No, but Taylor Swift has that song. I don't even listen to Taylor Swift. How am I telling you this? The 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 the, the, the song uh fucking uh it's like it's it's one of her songs. It's literally called Welcome to New York, which as soon as I heard that, I was like, I do like Taylor what Swift, is but this? how do I not know that song? I think it's from I can't think uh, of it's it. from it's from 1989, right? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I do like her hits. She I remember, great... yeah, basically what the, the, the background there is, and I remember this because I would actually have to see fucking articles about it. And I'd be like, what the hell are people talking about? Uh, it was like, oh, Taylor Swift moved to New York City. Isn't that amazing? And like, 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 I was like, oh, it's amazing where a person lives. And amazing yeah, that, that is a weird. celebrity that is with weird. a lot of money wants to live in Manhattan. Like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they made a song about it, which made me think that even the articles were just propaganda. The song is about her moving to New York? Yes. Yeah. 
It's like why it's should like, I not? I'm not aware of any I, of these. D- you know, do yourself a favor. I've only heard this song once in my life, and it was only because like I you were forced. Song, but, not <laughs> forced, but I uh, know people people were playing it to to make fun of it, and I was like, I still have to hear it though, and I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I I actually like like I'm totally capable of enjoying like uh, uh, female vocal pop music, but but I just particularly do not mess with Taylor Swift. I'm, so I'm apologies to, to to the Taylor Swift fans, and she see I, I, honestly she seems like uh, I don't even want to say this. She she I would like to be able to like Taylor Swift, but Taylor Swift and everything about Taylor Swift and everything about Taylor Swift fandom and everything about her online culture uh m- makes it impossible i'm here for impossible it for me. i like it i'm here for it i'm here for her cat yeah. content i'm mm-hmm. here for her sweaters all of the oh, cardigans God. um See, you're everything you're saying is exactly what i'm like no <laughs> no here for uh-uh. it uh-uh. <laughs> no it, i it's don't like i'm not like a like necessarily person who knows her whole catalog mm but I do know the hits and I'm a fan of the hits. Well, yeah. I, mean, I don't think welcome to New York was like a big, like radio hit, but I feel like yeah, it is I can't one of those even, songs. It's weird it's, because I'm, I'm pretty good with, with songs with like remembering I know, but songs. I feel I, like I just can't think of it at all. It's the album opener. And I believe that album was mm-hmm. like one of her biggest. So like, so what she tends to do also mm-hmm. is pick, and I'm, the, I'm not the only one who thinks this, this is a theory, a fan theory. She okay. picks the worst song on the album as her first as her first release okay. i'm not kidding i'm not i'm this not is, laughing. Oh, yeah, you're laughing i'm not laughing you're laughing uh, and i'm all right. not well, it's funny she picks way. this is science okay she picks mm-hmm. the worst song on the album to okay. release as the first single and then all the rest she releases as singles are bangers it is a strategy and i think i think it's a smart one yeah um so, <laughs> well, look, I don't, I'm not even trying to necessarily rip on Taylor Swift specifically with this comment. It's more like what I'm saying is use a shorthand that's quite literal and just accurate. Taylor Swift's not from New York. She never lived in New York no. before turning no. like 30 years old and became mm-hmm. as like a big, you know, pop star for, for, for ages at that point. Big so, cat lady uh, condo. Yeah. So I'm kind of like. I'm kind of like, you know, that's, that's all, that's all fine. But uh, it, to me, it is a perfect shorthand for a type of uh, pop Hollywood version of New York, which by the way, you don't even see anymore. Like it used to be that you'd have like five or six rom-coms set in New York, or you'd have just random movies set in New York. You don't really mm-hmm. get those types of movies anymore. So I don't know. No how one can afford to live this. there anymore. Marcus. Well, hold on. That's a separate issue. That's a separate issue. Okay. That, yes, absolutely. But that's, people I, I want to have leave a meet that cute? out of here. How can you have a meet cute if you can't afford meat? That never stopped. Okay. You know what? <laughs> now you're forcing me to take the bait on this. That never stopped them before because you're right. People can't afford to live there anymore. But the common thing, and this goes to the sitcom world and TV where it's like a little bit more forgivable because of just how unreal that universe is. Oh, yeah, friends, but, but, how but, do they afford that place? Friends, exactly. But that friends problem trickles into almost literally all the media that I classify under this welcome to New York tourist bullshit. It's constant there. It's like, because the whole point is, and, and, and there's a million reasons for it, but like uh, at the very least, it's just a, a sort of... L- disinterest in detail it the these things are only interested in the sort of again this very taylor swifty like wow i'm in the big city now like idea of like new york that's like very um well frankly whitewashed and very Mm. just like um again just like totally agnostic to to class or actual elements of like life and i i think that there's there's certainly movies that have an accurate or inside potential into upper class New York existence or like Wall Street existence or any of those things. And I don't know if I'd categorize them under the same category of, of movies I'm about to talk about, but I, I would still, they, they're at least accurate and realistic and specific to something. Uh, you know, an example of what I'm talking about is like, you know, an American Psycho or Wolf of Wall Street or even like, honestly, even like a Cruel Intentions gets it right, kind of. 
Um, hmm. So, so, so they, you know, basically what Gossip Girl was trying to do. I, I don't, I didn't watch enough of that to know how, if how real that was or not. Um, I also did not watch the Gossip Girl. <laughs> oh, I bet. I thought you were about to tell me you're Gossip Girl's biggest fan. No, hmm. no. My coworker, I have a coworker who is, but I'm not. I haven't wa- well, not watched it. I should watch hmm. it. Maybe I'll like it. I don't know. Well, it's coming back. Um, it's coming back on HBO Max. I don't know if you heard. Oh, I did not. Hear. Yeah, I, I, I very distinctly remember watching the pilot episode. And like that in and of itself was like kind of like a strange little movie that was like, I don't need to ever see more, but like, I get what this is. And it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> um, and that was probably the most accurate they ever were because usually when you make a pilot, you're like doing this a needs lot needs to be more. the feel of the show. Yeah. But you're doing a lot more location shooting usually. And um, there's like a little bit more because you can't just like retreat to that sort of, uh, our little weird show world because it hasn't been made yet you have right. to kind of be a little bit more down to earth in some ways um but yeah so 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 what am I, what i'm ultimately interested in talking about and certainly gloria falls under this category is the opposite of these movies which i would consider a quote and again this is a very definitions may vary but i'm going to attempt to define it the best i can and once we really get into the nitty-gritty of gloria i think it'll be very evident like all the things that are significant here but um like what i call like real new york movies and what real new york movies are they're not just movies that merely take place in new york or are shot in new york okay, okay. there are movies that there are movies that obviously are those two things probably um but they're movies that are actually concerned with capturing a certain unique flavor that you would only experience in New York period. And I mean, they're typically made by people from the region or at least people who have lived there long enough to like understand it. Um, and it's, it's like a very, it's a very cool thing because honestly, I mean this, again, I'm, I'm heavily biased here. I and mean, that's kind of like why I'm even making all these rules and definitions for it is because I'm, I'm biased to the place and I'm biased to like what, like what I think is good about it and what I think is not. And, and so I'm biased towards films that like in various ways help me uh, reconnect and recapture, especially since I live here now, it's just kind of like, Oh, right. That's, that's what, that's what that, yeah, right. That's how like, it, we, I can watch a movie like Gloria and I'm kind of like, I smell that fucking place right now. I like, I like feel it. It's very, very sensory for me. So, or like, I know that fucking dude, even if I don't know him. And sometimes I'll recognize the character actor, but I'm like, I know that dude, that dude was like, like I, he works at a place just like that. Or that's such a fucking cab driver. We're going to have a, a talk about the cab drivers. Um, I are, yes. Yes. I, was, probably, I yes, want to have you're a comment. I'm like, about dude. <laughs> you don't. No questions, dude. You're not gonna ask any. You're not we're gonna, ask we're gonna yes. You're gonna. I'll I'll break that down for you for sure. You're gonna you're gonna love it. Um, but yeah. So that's oh kind of like, oh that's kind of like the specific Could New, not York, believe. New York flavor. Now, this is also a and and, and I, I you know just to give some some wider examples. And it's funny that the way I first found out about Gloria is. Uh, and is it, I almost embarrassed to admit it because it makes it feel like this was just a lazy pick in some ways. Um, and obviously, it was, it's so Gloria is part of the, the new Jenna Rollins collection that they have on Criterion Collection, which does not include the notebook, but I'm glad oh. you brought up that she was in that. Um, it doesn't it's include mostly it. earlier, it's mostly earlier work than that. Um, oh, but, no, uh, earlier work, got it. Yeah, well, it's not, it, 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 yeah, it goes up pretty high, but it doesn't, it doesn't get to, I mean, that. she's. It, but I mean, she's still working, isn't she? Did she pass away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to think of the I feel last like she's thing still she still working. In. Mm-hmm. No, she's 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 a legend, and um, but anyway, anyway, so so it's part of that collection. But uh, um, Criterion did a uh, what they call the Adventures in Movie Going segments, where they talk to like it's sometimes it's directors, but other times it's just like into cool people that they like that like are really into movies that are movie buffs and they interview them and they basically ask them to like pick like a, a seemingly random assortment of films that they like that are available on the channel and just like talk about a little bit about them kind of do like a mini version of what we're doing 
Mm-hmm. And um, they had the, the, the Safdie brothers do one. And the Safdie brothers, if it doesn't immediately ring a bell, they're the brothers who directed um, True New York Guys, as, as I'm about to kind of allude, explain or allude to, is uh, they, did, they made that movie Good Time with Rob Pattinson. That's I, it's one of my favorite movies the last few years. And then they follow that hmm. up with Uncut Gems with uh, Adam Sandler. Oh, wow, which I actually did okay. enjoy myself. Yes, okay. So Uncut Gems, and as is Good Time, and as is basically every movie they've ever made, these are like quintessentially like real New York movies. I mean, that's basically what the Savage Brothers whole fucking deal is, is like they're like lifelong New Yorkers who want to make very New York movies and like just totally – soak in that type of specificity i mean they do other things too that i mean but i would argue that these are while not required to be quintessentially new york like real movie help supplement that one of the things they specialize in you'll know this from uncut gems is they love movies that are incredibly tense at all times right uh, <laughs> basically mm-hmm. and i don't mean they lack for humor because their movies are usually quite funny especially when you have adam sandler in it but it's like it's like they're tense all the times in the sense that like there's always that pulsating anxiety of like there's an urgency and like the characters like oh fuck I'm stressed out it's like like I'm like mm-hmm. desperate uh, of one smoking. of their films heaven can't wait it's like they're heroin addicts so they're just like I need I need my fix it's it's very intense and um, yeah it. it's always yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of that urgency. that's the right that's a quintess right word New York characteristic is is that sense of urgency it's one of the things that. Like I most would say contrast it with LA is that, you know, LA, the attitude of a lot of people and just the general vibe, and maybe it's because of the cars and the, the slow traffic and a million other things, the sunny weather, people are just kind of like, take your time. Yeah. No one in New York, no no one in New dying, York takes their time. Take your time. <laughs> and, and this is what we'll I mean, when you mentioned, you. <laughs> when you mentioned in Gloria, the way people don't react to some of the things she does, it's because it's because they're like, I don't have time to. Like, like, I gotta get, I gotta get on the train. I don't give a shit. I'm trying to get to from A to B. I don't have time to mess with, uh, with. And in New York, there's so many people that, like, if you stopped and reacted to every crazy thing you saw, you, you never get anywhere you're going. So, <laughs> so, you, so, so you know, so it's especially again, especially and like in the she, 70s. she pulls a gun. Gloria pulls a gun in the streets in broad daylight mm-hmm. at least. Yeah, twice. more than once. More than once. <laughs> no one screams or says anything some people barely look up um she's pushing she also is pushing a six-year-old into a cab oh yeah um, like shoving him also the people in the apartment see her drag him out and i'm sure they're the ones who told the who told the mob that she's the one who has the kid we saw gloria drag him out screaming where he was like no help me she, and that's an interesting just, all the actually, that's an interesting question there. i didn't think of that but you're i, I i'm gonna assume oh, you're 100%, right 100 percent. the mobsters went back there and were like where's the kid and they immediately just pointed gloria took him he was kicking and screaming of course they told him they have to they're gonna they're gonna get shot okay gloria i have, a, I have a no no i think you're right there's a couple little details that oh, i, you I mean think like, might maybe they just found out some other way no, okay, here's what I think happened there. And so it's a little convoluted and they don't really explain it. So you might be right. I could be easily wrong. And, and but I think what happened was the 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 obviously the, the 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 other members of the family are killed. The cops eventually get up there. Gloria and the kid are already gone by that, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. The cops seeing a murder scene and a missing kid, the cops conclude whoever killed the family kidnapped the kid. And immediately when they start trying to look for suspects, not knowing about the mob connections of the family themselves. And not knowing that um, they ushered her out with the kids and get that kid out of here. Right. Not knowing any of that. They, um, or actually I'm realizing another little detail that like slightly adjusts what I was going to say, but it's basically the same thing. I actually think they did know about the connections the family had because the husband was informing so they might have known, and but, but what they didn't understand, what they mistook, was that once they looked who lived next to them and realized it was Gloria, someone who would be in their system as a like a as a criminal, they were like uh, they were like oh well, obviously she did it, uh, obviously she did it, but like they might have even 
been even quicker to that theory because they already knew the husband was an informant. And once they realized that his neighbor was was working with was 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 a mob associate as well, they were like, "Oh, well, she obviously is the one who did it." Um, they're not thinking she's protecting the kid, nor would they really care because, as Gloria points out, it's like I can't go to the cops; they'll arrest me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Which at a certain point, you're kind of like, let them arrest you if it saves the kid. But uh, you know. yeah, it's she's not fine. exactly Miss Moore. You're gonna go through all of this stuff <laughs> instead of just going to jail. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I see that. Whatever, but um, I, I, you know, it is what it is with her. Uh, she, she is even as much as she learns to sacrifice for that kid. There's, she still is trying to protect herself too. She's doing the yeah, exactly. She it's is not really to, to the herself. end, and by then it's like I've I've definitely shot a few couple dozen and, people, so maybe I definitely don't want to go to the cops anymore. But well, she's not hey. she's not a trusting person. She even says later, like I don't I didn't trust anybody. Um, and <clears> she <throat> when, when when they're first alone together too, and she and the kid are in that first uh apart or first hotel together she's in her bathrobe Mm -hmm. but she's walking around holding her purse yeah she won't put her purse she won't put her purse down because she's saying i don't trust this kid to not take my money when i'm in the bathroom but at the end of the movie she gives him the money and tells him put in the socks because people will take it from you put your money in your socks because you're a kid and, That's, and yeah. you know, like that, that flip of, I don't want him to take my money versus take all of my money, please. And keep it for you. Yeah. Um, no, no, that's a, ve- that's a very, very good read. I, I didn't even think about that purse clutching. That's a great detail. Oh man. Um, I mean, uh, that char- like a little character detail for sure. Mm-hmm. Her, the, her little movements. Um, I mean, I try to, mm. I think that was obviously direction. I don't know if she, it was her idea, but if it was her idea to hold the purse, that's genius because it gives you direct insight to her state of mind. Okay. I don't, you know, I didn't so, like this so game, and I don't I'll, trust I'll, him. My, my, my response to that point is that type of detail in which this movie is full of is absolutely something that is an organic extension of the whole entire Cassavetti, uh, John Cassavetti's approach to filmmaking. Um, before I, I, I jump into that point, let me just conclude what I was saying about the Safdie brothers. The Safdie brothers did one of their adventures in movie going and they mentioned Gloria and I had not seen Gloria. And now this is where I have to it, it confess. Like it is a confession because I feel like I, I should be punished for this and I'm, I'm making up for it now. I'm making up for it now with what with this movie another movie i want to bring up and i think even maybe over the course of this next week or month i'm going to try to knock them all out because it's it's a this this is a marcus movie blind spot okay i had never seen any of cassavetti's movies before i saw gloria and and, until (gasps) today until last night i had never seen any other ones besides gloria so so the first time i saw gloria was like probably a year ago like I said, when it first popped up on Criterion, yeah. um, and it's crazy. I think it's really crazy that I hadn't for a couple reasons. I mean, believe me, it surprises me too. It seems really crazy how that somehow even happened in the first place because, you know, I, I went to NYU. I would have thought they would be showing. I his would have movies thought they would be class. showing his movies and, in every class. And and and, and that, maybe maybe they did. About. Yeah, right, exactly. But maybe they did, and I, it just so happened that every time they did, those were the days I didn't I didn't show up to class, which the, of which there were many. Um, <laughs> so, so there, there I that could be if one some explanation. Kind of subconscious avoidance because you weren't ready for him till now. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> I think I, it, that part of the reason I'm even saying this is because I feel like I have committed a crime against myself in this i think you i mean Um, it's interesting because i i would think that of the two of us i would be the least familiar with his stuff um but yeah tell me which which, what have you what have you seen i need to look because there's a bunch of cassavetti's that make well we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i i intended to list them all because i just wanted to give like a little cliff note about each of them even though i haven't seen them (laughs) and um and there's a reason for um, that, but um, the, like so, so I'm sure when I mention it, you'll well, you you'll, saw Rosemary's Baby, right? Rosemary's Baby. 
I've seen Rosemary's Baby, but I mean the films he directed, but even the films he starred in, like the that's was probably that's another one he starred in but did not direct, but I have not seen that either. So I, I haven't seen what that, else. That, the Tempest. Um I'm looking at what he's what he direct. Have you ever seen a woman of influence? No, and I know I need to. That's on my list of things. So maybe we'll talk see. about that in a in a future week for sure. Because I'm intending to watch that very soon. Um, oh my gosh, faces. he was in Colombo. He was in Colombo okay, so too. Colombo himself, Columbo's Peter one of my Falk, shows of is all one time, of his like key collaborators. Okay, okay. So, so I want you to put a pin in that for a second because I, I definitely want you to talk to me about Colombo in a moment. Um, How much so, Colombo means to me? Well, Columbo. no, it's 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 pretty relevant to this whole thing. Okay. Is it? Okay. So yeah, no, no. I'll, t- I'll tell you why in a moment. <laughs> okay my random so, love of Columbo. so so right so i never seen any of these cast of eddie's movies it's very embarrassing for me to admit this as like a, a so-called film person um but you know i always knew of them and understood the tremendous respect that they commanded i mean one way that that was always evident to me was you know very early on like when i was like 12 11 13 i would start like, as soon as I started, like, actually paying attention to watching the Oscars, I also started paying attention to watching the Independent Spirit Awards, which are always on the Saturday before the Oscars. And they have, and have always had, as long as I've been watching them, the John Cassavetes Award. And the John Cassavetes Award is, like, honestly one of the really cool things in the world because it's an award specifically given to an independent movie made for under $500,000. It's just a shit ton of money, but obviously compared to studio movies is like Sag a fraction, of a, fraction of a fraction. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, so this is, a, this is a kind of a very important thing. And so, I mean, Cassavetes, the reason he has that award is because he's one of the major people, if not pretty much the major person, though there are other important pioneers that shouldn't get overlooked. Um, he's like essentially the main person like credited with like creating what we think of as American independent cinema. Right. I, I think I, I think I did know that he was one of the first people to produce his own stuff. Yeah. And so just be so like, you know first, what? I'm just going to make it myself. Well, and so why not? that's, that's, that's what brings me to the other movie I actually watched yesterday, which was Shadows, which I had never seen. And Shadows oh, is Shadows. his direct. To, yeah. Well, the, I'm going to tell you about it. It's really interesting. And you'll, you'll probably want to watch it after I tell you. It's uh, Shadows is his directorial debut. And it was a film that kind of just grew out of a natural extension of his, um, the acting school that he started in New York around that time. Cause he'd already been in Hollywood films and was continuing to act to like pay his bills. But he's a guy who really cared about the craft of acting. And when he was out in Hollywood, I believe is when he met Jenna Rollins, who he then married and became his wife. So she, she not only has collaborated with him on, on most of his movies, um, and led most of his movies. Um, there's a couple she's not in there, the more quote, male focused ones. Um, but she, you know, she's been his partner the whole time in that way. So they, they, I mean, I'm giving, even when I give credit to him for things, I, I got, I feel like you should always think of it like she's right there as well. And I mean, there's plenty of things uh, we'll, we'll talk about with her credit. Uh, there. 100%. You got to bounce ideas yeah. off so, your partner. So she, yeah, so she, she, she was, she was his partner pretty much this whole time. He had another guy, uh, Burt Lane, who he started the acting school with. But you'll find this interesting as an actor. So his whole thing with his acting school, <laughs> this is going to make some people mad, or people probably already know this, but, what, but if you don't, it might make you mad, is uh, his whole thing was like, he was like the anti Strasberg. <laughs> it was like, okay. basically, he's like, he thought the Strasberg method was bullshit. And <laughs> it, was, it wanted to put emphasis on like, he was like, you know, I, I, these aren't direct quotes from him. This is just, uh, you know, paraphrasing what, you know, people claim that he said. I, I don't have direct sources on any of this. But basically, you know, the, 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 the tale goes that he looked at the Strasbourg method as like this overly like psychotherapy based approach that was like just honestly a way for people to be kind of very narcissistic and, and, and crazy in a way that wasn't real. And, uh, as his films would later become known for realism, one could argue he might've had a point because. I mean, I would argue he has a point as well because as a human being, because I've, I've studied, I've studied this type Mm -hmm. of acting. I've taken the classes. I've done the work. I think it's a little bit 
um, masochistic of you. And I think it, um, it doesn't promote self healing as a person. If you're constantly using your own trauma as, as inspiration for your acting, Mm. that encourages you as a human being to remain in a traumatic state and to keep that trauma as opposed to um, some other methods where you create this character independent of yourself. You don't say, yeah. oh, me and, me and my dad had a fight yesterday, and then I'm filming a scene later where my sister dies. So let me use my emotions about my, my fight with my father to bring out those tears that I need in this scene about my sister. So I get that. For some people, that totally works to redirect yeah. those emotions. But I think it's not healthy to, to, to linger on that fight with your father, to make it something, to think you need to hold on to it in order to be a good actor. I don't think it's healthy for me anyway, for a lot of, for a lot of us, I don't think it's mentally the right method. I don't think it's a sustainable and, and um, consistent delivery method for actors. So I no, get I, I, I totally. think, I think, I think everything you just said from what I've read and understand is more or less what Cassavetti would say, especially the masochistic part. Yeah. Yeah, you're so hurting, you like, literally are hurting yourself on purpose to create art as opposed to using the art and using if you have pain naturally, then use it sure, but not yeah. digging and not digging your thumb into an open wound to produce a painting with your thumb blood. You like well, you just I you don't need to do that. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, but like look, so so no, that's a that's a very fair description. I think um, you know, the way the way I understand it from what I was reading was like you know, he's still, and you see this in shadows, like he still likes the idea of like really putting you, the actor as like the, who you really are very front Mm. and center in a lot of ways, but to not do it in this, like like I said, this, this very like uh, masochistic using your trauma approach, almost the exact opposite. Instead, just like be really present in, in the joy of the moment, the joy of acting, like, just like, kind of taking of attention a, for yourself in this great way and telling a story yeah exactly exactly so that's kind of what i, I, I gather agree. about his approach on it and in that in that sort of like gravity it's like i think what he saw in the potential to to make shadows was that like um this was like he he wanted the film well, i'll explain why it's not quite this but he wanted the film to be entirely improvised like that the whole idea to make this movie was to make a fully improvised film because he had been doing all these long like long form improvisation exercises with his Mm -hmm. acting uh school and was like someone should just film this or i should just film this and And turn it into your story to make a film especially back then an independent film it it had been done before but it is incredibly rare to do because film cameras the lighting oh, paying for was, the film alone yeah because you, and you only got one take you only get one take with that well yeah you get as many because it wasn't get, digital so you well, had you to get, you, you that, get that film you get it's as used, much right? as you have on the film but it's like it's like you, you know a lot, a lot of times now when you're shooting digital they'll just quote let it roll again I love, mm-hmm. one of the things i love about the film industry I like it because I, I it makes switching back to film a lot easier, uh, which is something I like to try to do. Um, but like all, most, mostly all the terminology has been unchanged, even while now by the vast majority of things are shot digitally. So like yeah. again, I was just abusing "let it roll," but the reason it's called "let it roll" is because it was from a film you're rolling. Roll. But film. essentially, yeah. in a digital, you you will let things just roll because you're like you don't need a save film. Like yeah, you have your memory cards, but that like you're not gonna run out of that. Well, but so, not even that. Like it doesn't cost a lot of money to keep it rolling. Whereas back in the day, you had to pay for extra foot feet of film to keep it right. rolling. It's, you had to pay for that. It was though. more precious, but honestly, more precious. And I, I, I could, I could look, I could probably dig in deeper into the research and figure this out. But I think probably the more expensive cost, even than the film would have just been, and this is the ding because the film stocks they were using back then hmm. were much slower film stocks and were not nearly as responsive to light. So in other okay. words, in, if you, especially, so the, the here's the sort of irony if you're not shooting in a studio setting, which these independent films wouldn't do, be doing, and I honestly, this is what makes them great is because of the use of location shooting. But because you're doing that, 
you don't have the same sort of room and latitude to put in a bunch of lighting equipment and you, but you have increased need for it because the, you're in a darker the place, needs, smaller place. Yeah, the film needs a lot of light to be exposed correctly. So there's a lot of weird compromises that come out of this. And again, this is why people like Cassavetes are important, not just because they did it and did it well, but because doing it at all helped allow other people to do it because the rule book on how to actually be able to make a film on location in New York was being written in real time by this guy. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and, and, and then a couple other, I, because again, especially when I bring up that New York thing, there's a couple really cool, like, uh, independent films. One of them we're going to talk about one time. It's, I think it's called the, it's about this little kid in Coney Island. It's a super quintessential New York film from the fifties. This little kid in Coney Island. I think it's like the little rebel or something. And he's like, uh, is Pete Davidson in this? It's... <laughs> It's Pete Davidson as a child. I'm kidding. It's literally Pete I'm Davidson. Kidding. No, but you're, you're, you don't know how accurate that was. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing film. Uh, but yeah, so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a history of doing it. But like, by the time you get to Gloria, and this is the irony of Gloria, because Gloria is not an independent film. Gloria actually had the studio backing from Columbia. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So by, the time, but by the time you get to that, like the reason a studio would make a film like that is because at that point in 1980, there had been a whole decade's worth of gritty crime movies shot in New York. So it just, it, it was it was no longer a crazy thing to do. Now, I think Cassavetti's innovation still with Gloria was to set, like, really bring the spirit of everything he had done before into that mold. And it's, it's impressive. But just getting back to Shadows, because I think it's really interesting, like, he, like, funded this film because I think he got a lot of actors and directors and other people excited in Hollywood, even if they weren't going to be in this movie that like, yeah, you know, my acting school in New York, like I, we're going to make a movie and like, like make a movie. Like, yeah, yeah. We're going to like fund it ourselves. So he was using money from his own acting jobs, but also like money from like other friends, like William Wyler, like gave him money. Like a bunch of people gave him money. Crowdfunding. Um, OG yeah, crowd yeah. Funding. Early crowdfunding. Well, more like cocktail party funding. You know, these are people they'd be sure. like at the fucking Mad Men cocktail parties with, and they'd be like, "Oh, I'll give you a couple hundred bucks." Um, yeah, I don't know what the exact budget on this film ultimately ended up being, uh, but what was interesting too was, like I mentioned, the whole improvisation thing. It was like they wanted it to be fully improvised, uh, but inevitably they ended up rehearsing it quite a lot. And so a lot of things got locked in. Well, there's then, a lot of action that kind of needs to be, I would say, like a lot of the gun, a lot of the like. Oh no, no, I'm not talking about Gloria. Sorry, no, no, I mean, I mean, um, uh, uh, shadows, which definitely oh, doesn't shadows. have action. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, sorry, my bad. I should have made that clear. No, so but just jumping back to shadows for a second. Um, yeah, they, they they were improvising it, and but like because they ended up rehearsing it so much, and because um, they actually made a cut that then did not screen so well with even just people that were like, you know, film, film festivals and different things like that, like other friends. So they ended up reworking some of the, the content of the movie and a lot of the new scenes were more scripted. Um, I forget the name of the writer. I wrote it down somewhere that worked with them on it. Oh uh, yeah. Robert Allen Arthur. Anyway, the, what, what's really cool about this movie and why it was like, it, you could see like, they not only made it independent film, they did something you could only do in an independent film at the time. And mm -hmm. the result is really like fascinating to watch. This was a movie that was incredibly, in a way that would almost shock you today in some senses, incredibly frank about sex and race in like May 1959. So, oh, wow. yeah, so like you have the, the it's basically a story of a black family um there's two two of the members of the they're all artists they're all working uh together uh one's a singer one's a trumpeter and the other's a, a a writer who also does some like other painting and things like that on the side um and the one one brother the singer he's a a, a dark-skinned black man but the, the, his little sister and his little brother, presumably from a, a one parent being different, uh, are, are very light-skinned to the point of being uh, white passing in many cases, which is mm -hmm. important to both their stories because the, the one brother, the younger brother, and he's like – so again, to paint this 1959 scene, 
This guy wears sunglasses inside. He wears leather jackets. He's Ooh, like, it's like some, it's, yeah, it's this very like beatnik thing. They even referenced that. He's like, hey, he, so he's like, a, so he hangs out because I say he's a trumpeter, but he's really mostly a hooligan. Like he hangs out with like his crew of other like cool, cool New York guys. And they go around like hitting on girls at night and getting into fights with other guys who get mad at them. Are hitting on girls at night. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So, so he just wears this, like the movie basically starts and ends with his little thing. And that's the other thing. This movie doesn't really have a plot. It it basically is like entirely slice of life and little episodes, but there are some like big threads. But there's no through line at all? The, the best, the closest thing it has to a through line, and what I was about to get to, is so the sister. Remember, I said like she's she's like she and that, that the other brother I was just describing are, are kind of white passing. So the brother hangs out with other like uh, his like group of friends are a bunch of white guys, and it's unclear if they even know he's black. Like I, I'm not I'm not sure about that, but no one seems to notice or think he is. Um, but the sister. She's like, you know, she's, she wants to be a writer. So she has like this professor that she looks up to and goes to like cocktail parties with. And at one of the cocktail parties, she meets this guy, this very handsome guy, uh, his name, Tony. Now, by the way, all the characters, this goes along with the whole improv thing. All the characters are basically using their real names as the actors. So the, I love the, that. the sister is Layla. That's actually Layla in real life. Ben is Ben in real like life. He is you. Yeah, so so the, the guy oh. she meets at the party is this guy, Tony, and he's actually played by Anthony Ray, who's the son of uh, of Nicholas Ray, the famous director. But he never really, I guess after this, never really acted much again from what I, I, I gathered. Uh, it's interesting, though, because he was good in this. Uh, but he has to play just didn't like a character <laughs> who's like, yeah, well, so he's he's like this, he's like this handsome white guy. And he's, he's dating this girl. He doesn't realize she's black or part black. So mm-hmm. he, at first, like, there's, there's, I'm sorry, what, like, what year did this come out? 1959. 59, it came out, or it takes place pre- in 1959. I mean, it was shot in between 58 and 57, 58, but it, yeah, it came out in 50. Oh, okay, cool. Wow. Yeah, so, so, you know, oh, it's like it, a it's, commentary while it's happening. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So, I'm, what this movie is a, was a radical movie for the time, very radical. Um, but I think I think what's interesting about it, and this, this is what I mean when I talk about the realism, why this is such a fascinating movie to watch now, with the Cassavetti style, with that realism, because it's very naturalistic dialogue. There's no affect to it whatsoever. Like you, you were talking to me like, weeks ago. I feel like it gets brought up a lot when we watch old movies about like you know sort of the Hollywood style of performance and and all that. There's none of that here. People just talk yeah. like me and you are talking to now. Choose the way you act. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's wild to see that because if I watch another movie from 1959, a Hollywood film, I mean, yeah, if, maybe I'm watching a French New Wave film. It's a little different, but they're speaking French, so it doesn't have the same impact. But when I watch a, an American Hollywood film, 1959, I might be able to like deep read and read between the lines and put it into context, but I have to do that work. This film this makes you realize, and like a, it's, it's stupid to say, but it, like that's my point: is that like, you forget till you really see it. I think of like, oh yeah, these people were just people, just like you and me. They joked around. They they just were very natural, and especially with this this black family, these black characters. It's like when when a racist thing happens, it's not like necessarily this big dramatic thing. I mean, there are stakes to it, but it's like it's kind of like. They're just like kind of laughing like dumbass white people. <laughs> it's, like, 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 it's very real. It's exactly like how you would expect today. Um, and, and you you see that and it's like, it's, it makes you like relate to the past a bit more in a useful mm-hmm. way. Um, yeah. So it gives you that sense of realism and it makes you realize that realism was always there. You just didn't see it in Hollywood movies. So, and that comes down to this, this frankness with sex because the, the, the character Tony and uh, Layla, they're going on a date and Tony's like kind of being very pushy and forward about wanting to have sex with her. And she's a virgin and she eventually sleeps with them. And it's like very awkward afterwards. Um, but it seems like the tension's going to be settled and they're going to be okay. Except then Tony comes to mm-hmm. pick her up at her apartment and finds out and meets her brother, her dark skinned brother. And now is like, has like a, like a very like 
he's not really screaming or anything. He's just like quietly having a freak out. Like he's like having a panic attack about it. And the brother's like kicking what? him out of the apartment because he's just like, what the fuck? Get out of here. Because he knows what's going on. He knows he's like having a racist reaction. And thought that she was the white girl. Yeah, yeah. So he like, he shoes him out. And then, you know, the film basically from there just kind of like lingers a little bit in that sort of aftermath of like the 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 three the three main characters in the family. There's another fourth guy who's uh, Hugh's manager, the singer. And he's another dark, and it's really cool with him. I like this character because he's like a tall guy with like 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 a cool haircut, and he's like, uh, and the movie like because really what the movie is, what it feels like, other than these more dramatic moments that I was just highlighting, it's like mm-hmm. a series of just like little like little parties where characters are just talking and being themselves, and that again lends itself to that naturalism, right? You know, it's, it feels very real. Like the the two are sitting at the table, and the way you know me and my friend might sit at the table and be like yo, you're, you're killing the vibe with this negativity right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, we have these girls here. We're supposed to make them feel good and, like, have her having, a, like, the party's still going, and you're getting all serious talking about, like, race and stuff. Like, chill. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so like, that's the thing. And, it, it, like, it, it's so obvious that this movie kind of comes out, again, not to give Cassavetti some, like, unique or special credit or overly due credit, Um you know, it's like clearly because this guy actually was just like a cool guy who hung out in New York and didn't care what race you were. So he had black friends and like was like, I want to put them in the movie, too. Like, I think that's that's interesting. And like, we'll we'll be real and we'll be frank and we'll like talk about the issues. Like, we're not going to pretend it's all sunshine and rainbows because it's definitely not, especially not that. It's definitely not. I mean, that's kind yeah. of kind of the point of artists is to point the mirror at the right time. And have us yeah. take a good look at ourselves. Um, right. And no, I think and that it, might sound like it did that a little bit. Yeah. And it, it's it's cool. I mean, you watch it. There's a lot of weird stylistic flourishes. And you have to kind of wonder if it was like they just did that because they could as an experimental style thing. Or uh, it was just a necessary fix. Because, again, when you're making an independent film back then and you're – really don't have the tools that like because now it's a lot easier not just because of digital but because over time because of people like Cassavetes other independent filmmakers developed networks to like be able to be more effective but they didn't have that so like they probably had to do a lot of weird things just to cover up right. for like weird mistakes and but this is was this was cool because like you see with like you know what the, what was going on in France at the time with the new wave it's like those experiments and fixes kind of led to actual innovations of style that were were pretty cool so it's cool to go back and look at that movie um but now i want to kind of just to bring us back up towards gloria i kind of just want to run through this long mm-hmm. history but like i said i haven't seen most of these movies so you know i don't have too much to say on them but i just want to footnote them because it's an interesting little career arc to trace between uh john cassavetes and his 100 it really is yeah, and then you can tell me which of these you've seen um, if, if, if when they come up. So I'll start with uh, this film called The High Cost of Living. And this was this was actually just Jenna Rollins' is, uh, first film. So Cassavetti was involved, but it was another like smaller film made by Jose Ferrer. And, uh, you know, it, I haven't seen it. It's, it looks pretty interesting. Jose Ferrer's an interesting, interesting uh guy uh i believe that's the father miguel Ferrer is a good actor who unfortunately passed away not a lot mm-hmm. long ago um but yeah with cassavetes it starts with uh too late blues um and that film made in 61 that was his follow-up to shadows uh jenna rollins was in it jenna rollins was in shadows like very briefly for like a second i i, I couldn't even quite wasn't even 100 sure i made her out she's just like in some random scene uh the oh. dancers and stuff wow. Um, but not a year later in 1962, she, she co-stars and this is like her big Hollywood movie. Uh, she co-stars against Kirk Douglas in this Western, which is actually on Criterion right now as part of her collection called Lonely Are the Brave. And while I didn't get to watch the whole film and never seen it before. Oh, I've seen that one. Oh, you have really? That's I've her. seen that one. That's it young her long with Kirk. Ago. I think Kirk my Douglas. grandpa, my grandpa. My grandpa liked that movie. Yeah. Mm. Wow. It looks really good. I'm hot. definitely gonna watch the rest I mean, of it. I watched is, like the first. She is, but oh my god, her face. Yeah, she, 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 she yeah. So she, she comes like that's the thing. I watched like the first 20 minutes to kind of get see what she was like in this movie because I'd never seen a younger her in a movie. 
Um, so I mm-hmm. was like, oh, wow. Like she comes on and she's just like, it's a very interesting wow. film. It's a, it's a Western, but it's contemporary at the time set. So like, she's like, it's like Kirk Douglas is this cowboy, but he walks in and she's in like a very modern early sixties kitchen, like wearing a little like a, uh, like button up blouse and tight pants and like, you know, standing mm-hmm. in that perfectly erect kind of way. And it's like, oh, heavy. And like, so it's like, oh, wow. It's like very Hollywood, like, and very glamorous Hollywood. looking, very looking beautiful. Mm-hmm. But very quickly as the scene between her and Kirk Douglas progresses, it goes to this very like, oh, they're tit for tat. And it's like that kind of, not quite at the Cassavetes level, but it's like, it kind of is at that, like, this is a more naturalistic movie. And it just made you realize that like, people kind of understood that her talents and her just associations with Cassavetes and that's kind of school of acting. It's like, that was, if you went to her, you went to her for that. Like even then, yes. you know what I mean? So Yes, for, for like, realism it was very at a time when it wasn't popular. Yeah, and I also just want to note because there's another collection on Criterion that includes this movie because the movie was uh, uh, written by Dalton Trumbo, who, if you don't know, is a very famous screenwriter who wrote Spartacus, wrote a bunch of movies with Kirk Douglas in them. Uh, Isn't there a movie about him? There is a movie about him with Brian Cranston. Called Trumbo, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, from a few years ago. Because uh, he was he was blacklisted. And, and so uh, this was actually, I guess, made after he had basically made his comeback with Spartacus after being forced to be in hiding and, and right under fake pen names. Um, yeah, so that's a, this is a cool movie directed by uh, David Miller. But after that, we get uh, Cassavetes and Rollins working together again. Uh, and Cassavetes, so after uh, Shadows and, uh, um, um, uh, what was that movie? The High Cost, or no, no, not that, uh, Too Late Blues. Um, or no, Too Late Blues is the first movie. So basically right after Shadows. So he makes this big, and uh, not big, but makes this, independent film and it's like kind of considered to be this radical thing but just the mere fact that he did it and he's like his acting career at this point still going very very well um you know paramount signs an overall deal with him to both act and direct in movies not necessarily this even the same movies but like you're like you know it's like that classic overall dear thing that like the same thing that warners would sign with ben affleck now it's a contract like, yeah yeah it's like it's like oh you can star in these movies you can direct these movies or you can direct you can direct or whatever you combination want but we, we love you. We love you. We want you working with us. And so that this deal he signed with Paramount locked him. Only us. Yeah. It locked him into that. Right. For like a couple of years. And the movies that came out of that with him as director, because he was a couple of movies, acting vehicles, including some notable ones I'll get to um, mm-hmm. is, uh, is, uh, is this first movie, this, uh, that, that too late blues I mentioned, but then this one with Jenna Rollins, which was, um, a child is waiting from 1963 and this one and i, I want to see this just for this reason this one has her starring alongside judy garland and burt lancaster so it's like a very hollywood cast i think i've seen that one also <laughs> really okay nice, yeah. nice no i'm glad i'm glad you i'm glad you can point these out to me um but yeah so um, i was ahead. probably 13 watching it with my grandpa so it's been a minute but it does sound very familiar yeah yeah i don't know what it's about exactly um but it looks cool it looks very cool um i should re- we should rewatch. i should rewatch. yeah it. that might be watch one definitely to visit for sure uh you know yeah it's just like the three of those those three together in a movie seems very interesting mm-hmm. um but yeah so because of the paramount deal uh you know cassavetes didn't direct another movie till 1968 in the meantime you know, you know, he's getting, he got an Academy Award nomination for the Dirty Dozen. Like he's, he's in mm-hmm. some, some big movies. Um, Rosemary's Baby, as you mentioned. But uh, in uh, 68, he returns to independent cinema at, now that his Paramount deals up and makes Faces. I don't know if you've seen Faces. I have not seen Faces. Yeah. So that one, uh, that one has uh, Seymour Cassell in it and, and Jenna Rollins. And Seymour Cassell is someone that um, is, you know, is, is I, lo- I love as an actor, and he's in a lot of these Cassavetes movies. Um, as an older gentleman, I'm sure you recognize, would recognize younger him too, but I always- Is know he Tom related was- to Vincent Cassell? No, no, I don't think so. He's that French, Because he's not, right, right, because no, because Seymour Cassell maybe by, 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 you know, ethnic background is, had, might have some French ancestry with that name, but no, he's a, he's a, he's like a, 
he's like a short little like uh new york kind of guy and uh he was he was in that movie that i talked to you about many many weeks ago uh called in the soup with steve buscemi <laughs> oh yes i so actually that, really yeah, want to watch that you should you should i'll, I'll find it and send it to you it's in like the soup it was on amazon Is it on criterion or no i think it's on no, amazon. it wasn't yeah it's, it's one day i bet it ends up on criterion but uh yeah, so he's uh, Max Fisher's dad in Rushmore. He's that. There's like, uh, or he's in Royal Tenenbaums. In a lot of Wes Anderson movies later in his life, um, but uh, yeah, great, great actor. So this movie faces is, is this is one of the two that's like the most two or three that's like most embarrassing that I've never seen because it's just like this movie <laughs> considered like such an important movie. Um, you know, I believe yeah i got an academy award nomination for screenplay and seymour cassell got nominated for best supporting actor and yeah it's it's a big deal and then after that another big deal movie because at this point he's just making like crazy important movies like four back to back right he's on a roll is is husbands i don't know if you've seen this but that, husbands looks so familiar but i can't picture i can't remember Peter anything Falk about it, it. Yeah, Peter I think Falk I've seen it because Columbia. of Peter Falk. Yes. Yeah. So but I can't so remember anything about. I guess Cassavetes was in an episode of. Uh, um, he was in an episode of Columbo. Yes. He was in an episode of Columbo. He's a and, murderer. And I can't remember f- his episode, but Ooh, obviously so all the big guest stars the exact, were murderers. You know the exact. Yeah. Everything. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, they were also in this uh, Italian directed movie, General Rollins too. I didn't put it on my list, but it was like uh, the Man and the Machine Gun or something like that. Um, but yeah, no. T- so this is where I was going to say, tell me a little bit about this Columbo stuff, because again, Peter Falk, very relevant to this whole Cassavetes kind of universe, if you will. Even though I, show up in- I became mildly obsessed with Columbo, like middle school, high school. Mm. I just love, I love crime. I love true crime. I love cr- movies about crime. And Columbo is also so procedural, which I'm a fan of as well. Mm. Um, but it's very smart. Like, it's actually yeah. a pretty cleverly written show. And Peter Falk really, I think I, I mean, the first time I saw him in anything was probably um, Princess Bride, which I saw at like five yes, years old yes, or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. Mm-hmm. so, and I didn't know until halfway through watching Columbo that he had a glass eye. That what? one. Of, I didn't know that. One of his eyes is not real. It's glass. Oh, wow. He lost it. He lost it, I think, in an accident as a kid. And when I found that out, I became even more obsessed with him because I'm like, this man is a fantastic actor. And he didn't let the fact that he's missing part of his face stop him from becoming one of the most successful TV actors of all time. Yeah. And so after that, I became even more obsessed with him. I'm like, you know what, Dana, you need to stop being like, oh, one side of my lip goes down and one eye is bigger. So I can't be shut the hell up. Look at Peter Falk. And just work on your craft. Like that's, I literally, this is me talking to myself. No, no, I love this. I love this. You're, you're, you're cute enough. You just have to be cute enough (laughs) and just work hard and you'll, you could be Peter Falk. I feel like you've already proven this with some of the roles you've gotten. I don't, I think, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I've, I've booked enough work. I've booked enough work, but there's always, as an actor, it's 99.9% rejection, always. Yeah, fair. fair. So it's just coping with that. And, you know, mm-hmm. Instagram doesn't help. Everyone's, everyone's been <laughs> filled. Everyone has fillers and looks super symmetrical. Yeah, who made, and, like, someone, all someone was making the joke that, like, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it was this, uh, this little comedian girl. She was, like, making the joke, like, yeah, you know, just, it's easy to be on Instagram. Just, just unfollow all the hot people. Yeah. <laughs> Only follow the ugly people. <laughs> I just, I stopped. I just follow people that I know. There's a couple of famous yeah. people, but they're, they're the chill yeah. ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Peter Falk has been such an inspiration for me as an actor because of that. But not only because of that, because of his mad skill. He is. Yeah. I mean, so good. So well, actually, I'm so trying to I, I, you know, I'm not because... a Columbo expert like you are, but I, I have seen like a little bit of it here and there. Like it was just when I'd be like on cable or like Nick at night or something, I would see a little bit of TV land. I would see like little bits of it. And um, I, I, I never particularly, I know that was a Columbo fan that's going to make you upset. Never particularly stood out to me, at least at the time, but now in hindsight, knowing a little more about it and like putting, remem- putting those memories into context, I think I do see now like what was like what you're talking about with 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is this very smart show. And I think what I particularly like about it and something that I would even revisit and watch it actually, if you want to make me a list of like really good episodes, I would definitely check them out because, um, you know, I, I think I can do that. What's cool of as like Columbo is like, he was incredibly smart and sophisticated, but he was like a real guy's guy. Like he was like a working guy, a guy. And he just, you know, one of my favorite things about it. Okay, so yeah. there's a there's a conspiracy fan theory about Columbo mm. because he mentions his wife often. Oh, uh -huh. my wife! This he uses her in his investigations. Oh, yeah, my wife. My wife likes this song. Show me this record player because he thinks it's a clue. Yeah, but yeah. You never see her. She doesn't call him. I don't think she calls him. Maybe she does call him. No, but there's a theory that she's not real. I think I've heard this before, weirdly. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that's crazy. And he's always very disheveled. His car is like falling apart all the time, constantly smoking cigars. Um, yeah, he's yeah, quintessential he's, guy who does not have a wife. But he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he comes across, and I think that's part of his, part of why his character works so well. Yeah. He comes across as extremely unassuming and almost... You know, because he looks disheveled, you you mm. write him off as being an incapable detective. Yeah. Because he's a little disheveled, he's like oh, smoking, his jacket's always, a, his coat's always a mess, his car's falling apart, but he sees everything. Yeah, and, I love that. Mm -hmm. he's, yeah, no, best. definitely, I'm definitely, gonna, I'm definitely gonna bother about this because like, I actually do, well, like, I would be de totally down to watch like three or four episodes of Columbo and like, if you make me a list of what you I'll think, I'll pick are the my best favorite ones, ones. The best yeah. ones. Yeah. What are you, what are you, yeah. Whatever I've ones, I'm, I'm in for it. Okay. So I, it's, well, that's why I asked because it seems like you know every episode back to back. I paid um, so much it. money to own Columbo, and now it's just oh. free on streaming. <laughs> I think the There's, best. I think it was yeah, like hundred and sixty. It was like hundred and sixty dollars, and now I literally don't <laughs> have a DVD player. <laughs> Well, that's, and a real everywhere. that's a real kicker. You don't even have the DVD player. Like, I don't have a DVD player. Yeah. Anymore. Oh my god. No, no, that's uh, that's incredible. Yeah. So, so Peter Falk, uh, he starred in Husbands along with uh, Cassavetes himself. This is like the really the first time Cassavetes was like directing himself in a big, big way. Um, and uh, uh, Ben Gazzara, who's another Cassavetes staple, is in a lot of his stuff. Kind of like a really stocky Italian guy. It's pretty cool. Um, I, th I think I know his face. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's got a very distinct face. Um, then uh, he follows it up. This is what I mean about the role he's on. Because he, he went from Faces to Husbands, then to uh, Minnie and Moskowitz, which is another film with Seymour Cassell and Jenna Rollins as, like a, as a couple. And uh, that's another one that's on the collection. I, I think I'm definitely going to check it out this month. Uh, and then you get to what... Again, I haven't seen it, so this is not me giving this opinion. But from what I've gathered over the years and the fact that this movie constantly brought up uh, in film circles is uh, the why considered like the grand masterpiece, which is A Woman Under the Influence. And that's also considered to be like Jenna Rollins is like, like just tour de force. Uh, she didn't mm -hmm. win the Academy Award, I, which... I don't know who she was competing against that year. But but she was nominated, was, right? She was nominated. Yes, she was nominated. This is, so this would have been her second mm -hmm. nomination at this point. She would go on to get another like one or two, including right. for Gloria. She got nominated for Gloria. So that's uh, one one in the chamber for that for Gloria. All right. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but the film, you know, Pete. Uh, sorry, Nick Cat or not Nick. Nick's their son, uh, John Cassavetes. Uh, got nominated for best directing for it as well, which is again, incredibly significant for an independent film at that time. Like that just didn't happen. Um, you know, I, I probably mm -hmm. a lot that Cassavetes had a Hollywood career. So people knew who he was. I mean, that obviously helped a lot. People knew he, like, well, people at least, people yeah. at least respected that he might actually know what he's doing. Right. If you come like, from that background. It's like, Oh, well, He's at least been on a professional set and we are, we're all aware of the fact that he's done good things. So maybe he is doing something good as opposed to a complete nobody coming out of the woodwork. People would be like, even if this is great, mm. I don't know about it. Well, so have you seen this one? Because this one also has Peter Falk in it. Um, it's it's no. him and her wait, as wait, like a married husbands or 
No, no, not husbands. A woman under the influence I've seen husbands. is Peter I have Falk and Jenna Rollins are, are, no. are married in this film. And I know it's her best thing. And I, st- I have not seen it. And that's one I'm embarrassed that I've not seen. Well, no, no, sure. it, 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 you, you, I'm with you. So we're, we're both embarrassed. And, 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 you know, I only, I only made, I made us go through this masochistic exercise because if we're going to talk about Gloria, I, I feel like I shouldn't do it without coming clean about the fact that I have not seen these other Cassavetes movies. I feel like but that's you know why what? I wanted to do this. I wanted this to like just, just admit it. We're so just reiterating our own our own opportunities, Marcus. We are just yes, talking yeah, exactly. about the opportunities we have to watch good movies. We should exactly. be excited because no, no, I, these are good. They're classics right. for This is something reason. to look forward to. Yeah. It's no, kind of like when you have a show that a show that you are obsessed with but you yeah or a book that you finish and you're like damn I wish it wasn't over and then when you give it to your friend you're like I can't wait for you to read this mm. I think that's where we are with society oh, with yeah. some of these movies right now I, I do People, this like I every can't week. wait for us to see these <laughs> because of this yeah it's, it's, I was like I, I can't wait it. for this Dana is my film, to watch this is my film study class yes exactly <laughs> no I mean it's, it's very fitting I can, well I've passed it through um, there is a couple but, other things I wanted to say about it, but yeah, yeah. not much more. Uh, with other with, than nobody oh, freaking out. Wait, wait. Uh, oh, with right. Gloria. Hold on. Oh, go away. We'll, we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll wait off on that for one, 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 one more moment. Okay. There. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to say with the women under influence because this is what I mean about um, sort of the cast of Eddie's thing about this independent film. Like he shot this film in his own house. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Like, which is crazy yeah yeah <laughs> like you know what i mean it's just like oh, i'm shooting in my living room um you know I, i'm sure it helped jenner all it's because like this is my living room what the fuck are you doing like <laughs> yeah um, that that's actually part of getting ready for if you study like stella adler or some kind of like meisner techniques mm-hmm. is imagine like literally closing your eyes and imagining the objects in your character's room and their space yes. and yeah, I, I, thinking about the day that yeah. thinking about the day that you bought that thing mm-hmm. even though you didn't buy it your character bought it the, think about the day you bought it or who gave it to you or what it means to you right. all the objects in the space give you power um mm. so filming in your own house yeah so yeah after a woman influence we have uh the killing of chinese bookie which is another film that's on criterion right now i definitely want to watch uh very soon i have I not seen would... that but it sounds very yeah, it sounds exciting. cool it's it's about this is the one yes yes it's it's gambling? another yes gambling and gangsters i'm in so, i'm in yes i'm in and uh that that has good gazara and, and casal in it and um then you have opening night which is like peter or, or john cassavetes and uh jenna rollins playing actors like who are in a stage production um that I imagine is pretty interesting because I imagine a lot of like acting, acting, inner acting world stuff. And actually, Je- I mean, general. This literally collection. sounds like Inception. I'm oh, a director, yeah. acting, directing as a director, myself as an actor, yeah. acting like an actor. A hundred percent. No, but actually, so, so general Wong's collection on Criterion right now is literally called an actor's actor. So there you go. They're really leaning. I mean, into she that. is. She is. Yeah. Well, that brings us now. She makes solid choices. She makes realistic choices. Yeah. I, I Actors, actor. I, I mean, look, like, because now, now we're getting, now we, we've arrived at Gloria in 1980, which is basically more or less not the last Casavetti's movie, but like, like, like that kind of the end of it for him. Uh, his the, his run is ends basically here, um, and it's it's I think it's I mean again I can't really say it's a quote fitting end because there's so many of these movies I haven't seen but I've now I've seen the beginning and now I'm seeing the end and I think when I look at uh, the Gloria which like I said I mentioned this you know it is, was a studio film and I think it's like interesting that the whole basically the film industry had come full circle in the time he was making those movies we just went through because it went from there's no such thing as a a low a New York film independent that's not movie. an independent film, and now it's like New York crime all dramas are like the sort de jour with Taxi Driver and all these things. So it's like, uh-huh. oh, now and so what was interesting is John Cassavetes wrote this script presumably to capitalize on this this new reality, but was not necessarily intending on directing it at all. He he just was like this will be a way for me to make some money because I have an idea for a story and it totally fits in with the types of movies Hollywood is churning out now in the late You think 70s. he was going to sell it? 
I, I know he was. That's that's what I, at least I've read. Um, so you originally wow. was going to sell the script. And I guess I, I think it makes sense given this this picture I'm painting where it's like, it's like this is the type of movie that was very popular at the time. Um, so, you know, like this this whole sort of gritty, like, which I, again, we, we'll get to because I don't want to jump to the ending of the film. But there's a there's an argument that like this sort of happy ending is a little bit subversive and that it is a happy ending. Now there's other films around the same time or like right before it that fit that mold. It is. Too. It's almost too happy of an ending in the sense that for a second I was like, is that her? Well, it it, it? it worked. It worked for that, that reason because it was a surprise, because it was totally fitting that the awesome. film would not end that awesome. way. Awesome. Yeah, no, it was perfect. Mm-hmm. It was perfect. And I, that, that tells me again, Cassavetes knew exactly what he was doing. He knew okay. exactly what he was doing. With here's, an, here's, a, here's a question about that yeah, scene. Yes. Mm-hmm. Did the cab driver steal Phil's money and leave? Yes. What? You're going to take a six-year-old's money and leave him in a cemetery? Yeah. I, 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 or I, did, I got to I I rip the seal off. Did Gloria, did Gloria drive by and then just say, he's mm-hmm. fine, I got it, and he drove away? No, because we literally see the cab drive go away. off, and then we see the black car come Oh, yeah, up, then and, she yes. comes. Yeah. What so, a piece so. of shit. You're leaving a <laughs> six-year-old, you're taking all his money, leaving him in the well, cemetery okay. to die. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He could have come back. I actually do think that's not implausible, actually. And, and this is again taking this a something loop around. This is something I'm going loop to explain in a moment. And this is something I'm going to explain in a moment, but I don't want to jump right to the because once we get into cab drivers, we're going to stay there. So, <laughs> so I'll just before we get to that. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, you know, like I said, Casper is going to sell this script, and I guess the studio was like, "We're interested." And then they were like, who are we going to get to play it? And maybe it was because Cassavetti's name was already on the script, or maybe they're just like, this character seems like it was written for her, or who knows? The studio was like, well, we want Jenna Rollins to play Gloria. And then they were like, well, if Jenna's going to play Gloria, then I'm directing. So then he ends up directing the movie. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah, it was very simple, very simple thing. Um, but yeah, oh, one other thing that's interesting. So I remember even when I told you to watch this movie, I, had, I said... This Gloria specifically from 1980 with Jenna Rollins because, because there's like five there's movies another one. named Gloria. Yeah, there's a bunch. Yeah. There are a bunch. It, it, are they remakes? Because one of them looks well, like this a is, remake this one, specifically because it's, yes. I don't know, there, Sharon Stone with some yes, little kid. Okay, that, right, right, right. So that's what I was about to explain. So there's an actual remake of this film with Sharon Stone, but there's also another film that's unrelated called Gloria that was a Spanish language film and it had a remake also we'll call it this one they they because there was like got we it want to be the fifth Gloria we call this one Gloria uh Bell which so they added the last name to the character but that was the remake they made with Ju- Julianne Moore but uh okay the the there those movies are unrelated and I think there's a totally unrelated to all of these movies we also named Gloria but um, okay. Those movies are unrelated to this film, but this film was remade in 1999 with Sharon Stone, and it was a total disaster. Flop. Critics hated it. I mean, um, okay. How are you yeah, going to do better it, than? I agree. So, so it's not surprising that it was bad for those reasons, and just the fact that it was like totally made in that like like knockoff studio remake lazy way. What's shocking about it, though, is that it was directed by Sidney Lumet, who's one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. So I don't know what happened there. But, uh, yeah, it's for, you know, it, it did. I've never seen it, so I can't really comment too much. And I never will. I would never watch a remake like that's a bastardized remake. But um, there was going to there was apparently going to be a, another remake. Oh, man. And, with who? Yeah, that was going to made with Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> <clears throat> as the little not. boy <laughs> was she gonna she's as gloria <laughs> <laughs> she's not as old enough to be gloria no. what i know it I doesn't mean, make maybe. sense I, it was again another good director like paul schrader go. was gonna it do just it just keeps going they just keep going doing it younger and younger they're like cool. sharon stone okay that's believable maybe she could be this character right. Lindsay lohan as this character are exactly. you joking me 
Are you joking? Exactly. This is ridiculous. He's going younger ridiculous. and younger, totally nope. like losing what makes sense about the character. And being believable about, mm-hmm. yeah, no, doesn't All make that. sense. No, None of no. it makes sense. Honestly, if I saw Lindsay Lohan with a child, I'd be like, get that child away from her right now. <laughs> right. Come with me. Just step away. That's I don't know. Fine. Maybe that remake wouldn't have included the child element, in which case I don't know what the movie's about, but, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so, obviously, the, now we're, the Gloria we're talking about, you have Jenna Roll and she's playing Gloria. And what Gloria is, because this isn't spelled out in the movie too, too much, but I mean, I imagine you you caught the drift because the drift is easy to catch. <clears throat> but she's what they call a mall or a gun mall and like M-O-L-L. And uh, it's basically- I don't know what, what that is. Yeah, I, I didn't even know this term. I understood the con- conceptually what it was, because, but I didn't know there was an actual name for it. I didn't know that what it, that's what it was. Um, it's basically someone who is a, is, a, is, a, is a mob girlfriend and they're typically former prostitutes. So it's like, like, and when I say girlfriend, I really mean mistress. So it's like most of these mob guys, they'd be married. But then the, the, the term you hear more, at least if you watch like Sopranos or whatever, is guma. But I think the difference between a mall and a guma is a mall, and this is where the prostitute angle comes in. Okay. A mall is someone who's like the mobster's girlfriend who also does crimes for them, right? So I think if oh, you're so looking she's at- actually um, in yeah. like, doing stuff. If we look at like Goodfellas as an example, and I don't remember them ever using the, the, this term in Goodfellas, but like in Goodfellas, Ray Liotta has Karen, his wife. Uh-huh. Then he has his Guma Janice. Yeah. And for a very brief time, all three of them are all, because Janice disappears or something. But like, then he brings in Debbie Mazur's character, who like, at first I just always assumed she's like another mistress, but maybe she would be more technically considered a mall because even though I don't think she has a prostitute background, she basically becomes his way of like making cocaine. Like she like was the one who mixes it for him and he like uses that. So like the sex part of it is not just, I'm here to have sex for my pleasure. The sex part of it is like, almost like that's part of like solidifying our pact of protection Mm-hmm. In the way I would solidify the pact of protection with the dudes, except there wouldn't be a sex part. So it's like I'm you having my cake and eating just it spit too. Spit in your hand and shake each other's hands like the old yeah, days. Yeah, more so yeah. <laughs> there's, the, there's the more made ritual that obviously you have to meet certain qualifications to be officially made, but like it's kind of serving that. And again, this is why obviously Gloria is not made, and even as a mall, she's in uh, like a retired mall if you will yeah they so, like she's she of no use now so i don't they, that's what's interesting the the mobsters really were never intending to like fight her but she like shot first so now they're like well you're making would, us did you not think she was oh yeah yeah that's true because they they're like they're like you're well, on our was side you're, you're, the kid. You're, she you're wasn't gonna right. give him the kid but, but like in that scene that's what that scene is so great where the car pulls up like they're just like talking to her and they're not, they, they, they at most they're thinking they're going to get out of the car and like rip the kid from her. But like, that's your like, first we would never moment. Hurt Gloria. We're not going to shoot Gloria. Gloria works for us. We don't have to worry about Gloria going to the cops. Like she's one of us. So they're not worried about it, but Gloria's like realizing that they're not just going to let her be and let the kid be shoots first. Mm-hmm. And like this, um, okay. Well, I, even before I get to that, cause I was about to segue to something else, but we got to focus in because the, the gum all thing is interesting. And I almost just throw it out there just to give like a little context to it. But really when I think of Gloria, I think of nothing else. This is why I want to talk about this movie. I picked this movie because it's mother's day this weekend. I mean, maybe that's <laughs> obvious to you by now. Maybe that's uh, obvious to you by now. I didn't think but about it, but yeah. <laughs> Gloria, Gloria, Gloria is a Bronx lady in the way that my mother's a Bronx lady. And <laughs> Bronx ladies are fucking crazy. So like, and, and uh, granted, I don't think my mother's type is the same as Gloria's type because there's variations of this. Um, but I would say Gloria's type is like the perfect t- version of like, it's, it's a very specific type within the type, but it's also a good type to use as like a rule, a rubric to explain all, all the other variations. So, I mean, you said it, you brought it up when Phil's like, you're tough. And it's like, like, 
Phil's like a little kid because he's like, he already knows. These are most of the women he knows are kind of like this in a way. So when he says Gloria is tough, he's like saying like, and this is what he means. Well, not tough. To, like he means like you are a cut above even the, the norm around here. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, look at his mother. Yeah, his, his mother's his own fucking mother crazy. The gun was waving around a gun. Yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly. That's what I mean. Exactly. His own mother was a tough Bronx lady too. Um, but like, it's it's uh, it's it's pretty funny. So 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 like, kind of like one of the key. There's a couple key little distinguishing things that kind of fall into this, right? And you see it right in that scene we're just talking about, right? Not just the mm-hmm. decision to pull out the gun, but just like the whole way she gets out there, right? The movie like the beginning of the movie, I love the beginning because like the whole way it's introduced, you, you're just seeing the family and they're obviously freaking out about something. You're trying to catch up with what it is. There's a knock on the door and it's one of my favorite deliveries ever. Um, and this is why I think they got an actor probably as like, you know, well, good regarded as like a supporting character actor as like Buck Henry to just to play this guy who gets killed in the first like 10 minutes of the movie is because he has the amazing job of doing the turn go it's gloria (laughs) the way he says it it's just so perfect and within seconds of her end of the door um the jerry the the the, her friend the mother is like like no you gotta you gotta take my kids you gotta do it you gotta and and she's like talking really fast at her she's like whoa whoa, whoa, i don't i don't like kids and she's like what are you doing and then she goes she adds and i already quoted this but she goes i hate kids especially yours and i was like again this is this is to me what I mean about this quintessential Bronxness because it's not hating kids that I'm talking about. It's right. The absolute no frills frankness in the way they speak and in think and compute things. It's like it's like why would I ever like the idea that even the notion of being polite is foreign. And sure, like, yeah, it's it like it's like, it's like it's like that doesn't even register in her brain that anyone would. Like not just be like I hate kids. What do you mean? <laughs> like 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 you're not gonna unload your kid on me. Um, so yeah. So the, the time she comes out of there, and uh, this is another thing that's like very specific to her type of bronze lady, and very specific probably to go with this whole mall idea. She's always wearing her heels. She's always like very like pr- put together in a weird way. But it's like put together in a way that's like it would be feminine if it weren't for how fucking aggressive she moves and walks in it. So you know what aggressive. I mean? Like, no. And that's geez. what I'm talking about. So you have that scene. It's the first time Bombs you're even outside. Um, the first time you're even really outside, outside of the, those opening, uh, you know, helicopter shots. And you're just walking out. I, I don't, I don't know exactly that block is, but. It's 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 such a good block because it just looks like the Bronx in a very specific kind of way, and with that that sort of like um, sort of curving uh, island in the middle, and the fucking car whips around that curve like it does that U turn like that hard U turn and Gloria just doesn't even move. Fucking car comes up and they start talking to her, and like this is what I mean like they all know her and again that's because the mm-hmm. mall thing but there's like this very thing that kind of works as this shorthand of what I'm talking about like about like the sort of like kind of Bronx like culture is like, it's like, Oh, I know Gloria. It's like, yeah, Gloria, come on. Like you, like you, 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 you got a level with this here. There, she's just like, she's going along with it, but you could tell like the same way she might've been if some guy was like trying to pick her up. She was like, yeah. I'll go along with this for about five minutes, but second. now you're fucking pissing me off and you better get lost. And that guy makes the mistake of no, but please. And then she's like, I'm fucking shooting you in the head. Because she literally pulls the gun out of her purse and just starts firing. And it, if you weren't sure what kind of movie this was going to be at this point, this is where you know it's like, oh shit, this, this is, is your a movie first where this lady's going to start shooting people without warning. She's not. She does not like shoot second defensive. And this is, I didn't even realize it till I just started talking about it. She really is female Han Solo, like OG Han Solo, like before the Shooting fucking George first. Lucas tweaks. She <laughs> shoots first Han Solo. She yep. absolutely shoots Greedo first every time. That's what she does in every <laughs> scene in this movie. She shoots first. She's like, I'm tired of this conversation. Whip bang. <laughs> like, <laughs> even when she's escaping <laughs> at the end, she still manages to shoot first. Like, uh, it's amazing. So she's not fucking, she not, she's not doing it for self-defense. She's just like, these guys are annoying me. 
these guys are going to like, they're not, they think they're, they, she's actually just offended that they think that, that she, they're going to like plead her into giving her what, uh, what the, giving them what she, the kid. Yeah. yeah. The kid. Right. Like, Oh, but Gloria, come on. Like that, that's, that's basically what it is. Now, the most amazing thing about that scene, and this is where Cassavetes, I think, really is like highlighting again, like this movie's super New York in a way that only like someone like me, who's made so many New York movies, knows how to do. Um, he fucking, they, they, she shoots that car. She shoots the car, tries to get away, keeps shooting. The car flips over. So it's like a cool little action beat. Oh, the yeah. just laying She there. flips that whole car. Immediately, as soon as she's done firing, she goes, Taxi. Like to call, how a taxi and taxi. the taxi comes up and a, like classic cabbie fashion the guy goes what happened over there and she's like yeah, shut up who cares like drive <laughs> like, and this is where i want this is where we finally get to talk about it because i know you've been waiting okay <laughs> you have to understand as crazy as it seems to you that everything with these cab drivers is 100 percent accurate and it it's insane. like it's it's so it's so specific too about this okay so just like i said the sort of just interest but blase and almost like you're gonna be yelled at if you start talking to me about this for too long attitude about like a car accident right up there he's just like oh it was the accident like he wants to know because he's like am i about to get jumped and she's like no you're not gonna get jumped but if you keep talking i might pull a gun on you so he's like all right fuck you i'll drive and there is like this hostility at all times between <laughs> cab drivers and their passengers. And Why? I don't mean hostility. I don't necessarily mean hostility in terms of like, it's always like negative. In fact, it almost like what I'm saying is that negative is such a default that it's almost like cozy and cordial. And that's what this movie gets right. Like, um, like the whole way she like break and change, like that's what the whole drive and come back thing. So when, uh, Phil at the end gives him the money. I said, maybe he will come back because Gloria in classic New York fashion is just like, you know, I've changed for a hundred. Now I'm not saying normal people would do this. Like the, the cause the mm. reality is there's, it's very likely they won't come back, but yeah. it's not, it's not so crazy as you might think, because it's just like the cab drivers, especially like, cause a lot of cab drivers come from immigrant communities and different things like that. Still to this day, there's more of a sense of like honor an ethic that's just like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the real rules are it doesn't it's like, matter it's like you give me a hundred even if, if there's a city with like fucking 10 million people i want to see you around so i better like give you give you your change or if yeah. like you run into me in six months you're gonna ask me for the change with interest or something and and get some guy to come fuck with me but then so, but so then they, they're like i'll come back i'll come back if, if if you know as long as you don't act too crazy i'll come back and give you your money um but there's also the classic thing where it happens in the one scene with that guy, Sill. Uh, and this is such a cab driver thing where he kicks them out of the cab. This is a thing that happens. And granted, it's for good reason. But like when a cab driver's like sees two, like especially a man and a woman getting a little too hot in the back. Like I don't mean like, I mean like just fighting, whatever it is. Cause he's just like, I don't know who these two people are. Like they're, they're getting a little too snippy. He's like, all right, get the fuck out of my cab. And if the guy or there's a girl, and either of them lingers too long, then his next move is to pull his baseball bat out of this fucking driver's seat and be like i'll fuck you up you don't get the fuck out of here get right out of now. here so so that's the thing and it's actually funny um as i mentioned the safety brothers they have a great sequence in good time where uh one of the characters gets kicked out of his cab and and rather than just actually getting kicked out he jumps out of the cab while it's moving <laughs> i don't know i think it's because the cab's like i'm gonna take you to jail and he's like what the fuck you can't take me to jail so you can't take me to jail it's 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 insane um, that was pretty crazy <laughs> yeah there's another scene where she has a, a female cab driver and it's just like she's uh there's just the way they're shooting this shit but not you not shooting shit it's still very hostile it's just like where are you going it's like all right i, I go there i don't go there it's just everything's very terse and direct and that's what i mean about the comfort like even when it's like comfortable and it's almost comfortable because of this it's very like snipe and like direct um another great moment that's again so quintessential cabin i think which he i don't remember if it's which exact moment it happens in because that's what i mean there's so many cab drivers and scenes of going into cabs in this movie which is in of itself there's so is many like, is, is is really great but she gets in one point me i think it is with with sill uh before they get kicked out she gets in the cab 
He's like, where are you going? And she goes, I don't, I don't know. Go up a block, make a left, then make another left. And he's like, that's a one way. And she's like, oh, they, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't they go, go the other way. Block. They may, yeah. Like, she's like, go so one down one more block. They go one further down. So there's a couple little things in, in just even that exchange. They're so quintessentially New York. And <laughs> when they, like, when I hear them, I'm just like, oh, that's amazing. So especially cab drivers, especially pre GPS, because this is different now. Because they, you know, obviously there's Uber, Ubers and shit there, but even the cab drivers have all that GPS shit. Most of them don't use it, but like if you're a tourist or something, you'll just use that, obviously. Or even if you're not, you might still just like input it the way you would an Uber. Um, but the way people like give directions in 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 New York is oh, especially in Manhattan, is always like how many blocks away it is. And, and, and if you're really hardcore, especially if you're in a cab and you're doing turn, it's like how many turns or like which direction of turn. Oh, wow. And so That's, a cab wow. driver is so used to navigating that way and taking in directions that way. Mm-hmm. That he knows when someone messes up and says to take us extra left, that leads them to a one way they can't go up. So he's like, yeah, it doesn't work. So he's like, he doesn't even hesitate. He's like, no, no, that's a one way. That it, and when he means a one way, he doesn't just mean a one way because they're all one ways. He means a one way that doesn't go the way she thinks it goes. Um, so it's just like, again, really quick shorthand. It's like, I don't know, whatever, go another block. Because that's the thing. They alternate every block between which way they're going. So, so, so she's like, go another one. And of course, obviously, they end up getting kicked out. But I, again, you know, the whole thing with the cab drivers too, it's a part of that larger attitude that you see in the, because the, the, they have both major New York train stations in this movie too, which I was like, yeah. wow, they have Penn Station and Grand Central. Oh yeah, they wow. They have set pieces in both. So I was like, that's just did like, just that's a flex. This- that's a flex on, on them. Did they, or did, so they actually shut that down because Paramount produced yeah, it? I don't so know. They paid sh- for it? The Bofors were so big that, they could just like really cordon off a very small sliver of it and it will work, which is what I think we got. Um, and back then there's probably, um, there, they didn't, I don't know if they had express trains yet. So maybe like, because of that, there would have been more trains. So if someone wanted to shoot on a subway, it was a little bit easier to just like give them a car because they're just like, um, you know, they had more of them on the, on the rails at that point before mm-hmm. they all got f- too fucked up with the, all sorts of shit dead bodies i don't know <laughs> they're scary <laughs> they're scary but yeah the, obviously the set piece on the subway is really cool um but yeah like i i just mean like you you get that whole thing that you're talking about where people are just kind of like um you know looking the other way and and whatnot but uh to kind of before we kind of wrap up here i definitely want to make sure we talk about it and we mentioned it mentioned it earlier and this is really the other thing. And the whole equation with this, uh, this Mother's Day stuff to me is like, yes, Gloria reminds me uh, of my mother in some ways, but like even just the vibe of the, 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 the New York. The New York, the, the yeah, New York like, lady vibe. New York lady vibe. But it's like, it's like, yes, it's in the 70s. So it's before my time. Um, but like, like there's certain very specific like views and aspects. Like you start with that view from Yankee Stadium and, even where they are like it's like it clearly puts you on like the southeastern part of the bronx um which is a part i'm very familiar with so i was like oh right away there uh you know you're in the 140s 150s and then like you have um one totally random seemingly detail but is another thing that relates to a whole different aspect of uh of 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 of, of life back home and, and growing up is um in gloria's apartment mm-hmm. there's a tapestry in the background for Lake George, which is very strange because it's like, oh, I mean, I guess maybe it's not. Maybe she did go up there as a kid or even maybe, who knows. But uh, Lake George is, is, a, is a lake upstate. Um, and it's a place that I, I grew up near and like would be around all the time. And is, is a truly beautiful, beautiful like lake, air, uh, like wilderness forest area. And with, so anyone who had a, like, a, lake, a lake house on Lake George was always like a spot to go in the summer and, and it was just great, great times. So that, that was just nostalgic there too. But like I said, like this, this whole thing, I, that whole vibe, because it's like my mother's side of the family is, is who's from the Bronx and stuff. Um, you know, I, I just, I just associated with her and my mom is that kind of tough lady. So I always think of like, yes, I, I don't think my mom would ever say I hate kids as if she hates us, but she was, she did not suffer fools or suffer, 
uh, <laughs> in, in very impatient. And, uh, you know, I don't think I was like Phil or anything because I, part of what I want to say about Phil is, yes, ultimately Phil and her have this mother-son relationship and that's what it's about. But like Phil's also doing something else where Phil is a sort of like, like, like one of these, like, uh, what I'm, because I haven't really seen these movies as we're talking about, but like, what I kind of imagine, like, a Seymour Cassell or like a Peter Falk is like in these cast right. these movies, shrunk <laughs> down into a little pint sized body. And so he has these great lines. One, the best <laughs> one is, is when they try to go to the hotel, he's like, and the guy doesn't give them the room. He's like, he don't know the score. He sees a guy like me and a dame like and you. And a dame like you. A guy like me and a dame like you. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is this kid watching? And then he yeah, obviously mentioned, you know how my mother, you, my mother's beautiful. And the way, like, I mean, the accents, obviously they're authentic, but like they're, they're very, yeah, oh, good, very I, good. Like, I, I mean, toward like, the end, he's, there's a lot, he says, um, you're everything you're my whole family my mother my father my friend my girlfriend all that <laughs> i love how he peppers i mean the whole way he like like flirts with her it's hilarious give like, me a know, chance I mean, to be your partner <laughs> yeah give me a chance to be your partner but like i love how like, obviously she almost like acknowledges it for in a direct way when she says as you pointed out at the end when she's meeting with tanzini she's like she's like uh you know it's like he's the best guy i ever slept with but like literally he's like getting into the bed with her and he's like you like me <laughs> like what the fuck <laughs> but like that's what i mean it makes it funny because it's a little kid saying it but like most of the lines you could just easily put in the mouth <laughs> of like an adult male and it sounds it'd be oh, the same absolutely. dialogue that's why it's, it's great <laughs> and even her responses which are obviously tinged by the fact it's a kid but still sound the same like and this is what i mean this also reminds me of my mother because despite how intense and hard and just like direct they are there's something borderline childish about the way they think and react to things. So like they would react to a kid the same way they react to adult and, and, and in a way that makes them more childlike. Cause they're kind of like, uh, they, it's like, almost like they're acting like a child's like, like more equal, if anything, weirdly. Mm -hmm. She's like, she's like, what do you mean? Oh, I, yeah, I don't I'm not, I'm not impressed with you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, like she's like, she's constantly giving it back to the kid. Like, Oh yeah, okay. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go in that bar and have a drink. And if you don't come in there, fine. Like fine. <laughs> like she's like she's basically talking like it is her like boyfriend or something. Um, so it's just it's just really kind of beautiful that relationship. And you know, again, I talked about the way Jenna Rollins' wardrobe in this movie is, but it's it's so perfect. Like in in contrast to specific set pieces because. On, in that uh, Grand Central and then the subway uh, car section that goes that goes into it, which she takes the gun out on those guys. Uh, mm -hmm. She's like wearing all pink. Like, it's just so fun. Yeah. It's like, she's wearing all pink. Matching so it's like All outfit. pink with her blonde hair. Got but lower. she's got the most fierce expression on her face of like hate. She's like, I'll fucking kill you. Like, she's just she's so <laughs> intense. And uh, yeah, I just, I love that imagery to it all. So I, I, got, I got to give it up to you know to mom and moms everywhere because gloria is definitely a mom's movie one other thing with the uh <laughs> ending uh you, we already talked a little bit about it but uh the music in this movie was done by bill conti who did the music for rocky in the rocky series so like there's like that is that like very intentional like kind of like triumphant attitude about it like, you know, like, oh, the slow-mo at the end where he's running to give her the big hug. It's like, it's like, it's, it feels <laughs> very like I just won the fight, motion. you know? Yeah. yeah. He's it's, smiling it's beautiful. so big. Yeah. Like, yeah. He says he didn't, he's talking to her grave and says, I didn't know I, I loved you, you until dead. now. Oh, yeah. I didn't know Again, I loved such, you until that's now. That's such like an adult male's dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, look, look, uh, the, the, the little actor, John Adams, like, he, I just, I'm so impressed with him in this movie. What was, what a crazy thing for him to, to pull off. And he does it with such a smile, like that just feels so authentic where he's like, yeah, I'm cool as shit in this movie. I'm a little kid, but I got swag. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his outfit doesn't, doesn't. His outfit is like the most 70s, it. like swag His little 70s outfit. man, he's got little platforms, <laughs> tuck his shirts, his shirts tucked in. His shirt is somehow his tucked in this whole time. shirt tucked in the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh this is such a classic new york kid line he has in there this is what everyone writes he's like i got friends i want to go home i want to play stickball <laughs> 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 like, 
it's it's so great so great but yeah uh we can kind of start to close it up you know any other things you want to mention before we go i think he thinks she's not coming back because when he goes how do you know that tony won't double cross you Mm. and she goes he won't double cross me i know him and then he asks her how do you know that he won't kill you and she goes anyway so you're gonna meet me if I don't show up, <laughs> she totally changes the subjects. And I there's yes. a moment where I think it the camera shows us that he picked up on that. Yeah. She might not 100% she's, she's not right. coming back. She's probably not coming back. And he's that's why he goes to the cemetery. Well, I mean, credit to her. I did that actually just remind you. I, I and then she and then he says he loves her and she says thanks. <laughs> I do want to touch on it really quick because when I think about Jenna Rollins getting an Academy Award nomination for this movie, yeah, it might be the sweeter moments, but really. That scene with Tony Tanzini and the, the whole way that's played out, her whole performance in that scene is like, it's next. It's, it's such, it's so amazing to watch. Like she just like, the, cause this whole movie's built around that, again, that confidence that comes with being this kind of tough Bronx lady. It's like, she fucking sits down and she's just like, just having a very frank conversation with him, but she's forced because he's just being, and he's just being that classic mobster guy. Who's not even like a, and it's so accurate. He's like, he's not even being a tough guy. She's just like, it's like, because that's his ex-girlfriend. He's like, come on, come on. It's all very nice. Why do you got to do this to me? And it's like, and she's like, she's like, he's like, I know, I get it. You, you like, you want to be this kid's mom or something. And mm-hmm. she obviously doesn't t- take the bait on it at first, but she more or less admits it. And you can feel that protected. But like in that classic thing where it's like, she's hot female Han Solo. She's like, <laughs> all right, I get it. You got the big guys around. Okay, you're going to try to kill me. All right, well, don't just make it quick. Don't torture me. But she knows. Let me like, have a drink. I'm going to shoot my way out. Like, I'm going to shoot my way out. I don't know if I'll survive, but I'm fucking shooting first because that's how mm-hmm. I roll. And that's what she does. She still manages to shoot first. And what's so funny is, again, the classic little detail. Because she's, because she's clever. She asks for a drink, takes clever. one sip when they're not. And they think, oh, should they, they go, they leave the room, they go sit down. They think yes, they're going to have a little right. more talk right. before we kill her. We've got yes. maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes before we go in there and kill her. Not two seconds later, she comes out with well, the two gun. Two of the guys come out of the bathroom in towels. In nice. towels. <laughs> Why are that's two of them in mention. there? Why are they, what are they Ooh, both doing? Who knows? It might be a sauna. I think that's what it's supposed to be, but uh, I, it's weird. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> but they weren't prepared. <laughs> they were like chasing after a towel. I mean, like they, you know, they're just firing into the elevator shaft, and that's where you leave it before you cut back to Tony and like the way he picks up the phone. He's like, "Yes, I'm the man." <laughs> okay, <laughs> and he goes to Pittsburgh. I love the way he's talking to that guy on the way out of the trade. It's like he's like, he's like, I think it might have been two stops ago. And he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's the cemetery." He's like, "That's the one." Like he's that's so, the it one. Makes, and he's that's like, "That's like not a, even close." <laughs> well, you know what? So that's that, and this is a good note to end it up. But like, that's what I wanted to circle back when I said about like what's so. Uh, amazing about the ending is the way it surprises you is because the way it's playing out it's like reminding you tony you know he's a little kid yes but he's a very effective little kid he's even more effective now than he was before thanks to like what he's picked up from gloria so like you're kind of like he's gonna be okay somehow i know it's fucked up and he's an orphan homeless orphan who just lost the only people that he's ever loved like all dead in like a day but uh he seems like he's going to be all right. And then the fucking surprise and the way he reacts to it, this is what it means about his acting and like really just cast about his directing. You can just tell like, this is, the, this guy knows how to direct actors like no one else because he just yeah. like, he's like, he, well, he, he is must have been like, well, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, he's, he's been, he's an actor and he's been directing these amazing. He's an actor's now, director. Yeah. 20 years, 20 years of filmmaking. And he, he's working with a little kid. And I don't really think, I don't know how much he had done that before, but he's like, mm-hmm. he's like, when you see Gloria, you're not even like going crazy or shocked. You just give that big smile. Like you fucking have me going. You have me going. <laughs> like, 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 it's like, 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 you know, you had me for a minute. And then, then, then after that moment of just doing that, then you let loose with your full emotion and run to her and this triumphant music. And so great. <laughs> so great. So yeah, love the movie. Was really glad to watch it again. I think it's the perfect mother's day pick. In fact, I you know I recommend anyone who wants to give their mother a good Mother's Day, unless they're just a weirdo, <laughs> to play them Gloria because they'll love. Her. <laughs> Mothers are badasses too, you know. Badasses too, awesome. <laughs> we get some women, take them to the Peachtree Dance. 
I say get liquored up and take him to the peach tree dance. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know why? Okay. <laughs> it's a scary thing to give to a guy like me. Do you know what I mean? I say get liquored up and take him to the peach tree dance. Do you know what I mean? I say get liquored up and take him to the peach tree dance. Thing to give to a guy like me.